record. Recording now. All right. Welcome to back. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to back. First time. Welcome to back. back. <laughs> in a world where nostalgia rages across the land, where everyone and their mother has a podcast, where there's still a movie trailer guy who says, in a world. Three friends revisit films, shows, and games that molded them as they search for answers to life, the universe, and everything in between. Settle in and join us for Screen Refresh. Welcome back to Screen Refresh, a show where we revisit the films, shows, and games that molded us as we search for answers to life, the universe, and everything in between. I'm your host, Nick, and I'm joined by my fellow Screen Refresh crew, Dean, David, and Tim. Now, are there four of them? His metachlorines are over 9,000. <laughs> roger, roger. That's not a lot in a Jedi. <laughs> Jedi. Well, I mean, he had 20,000, so it, it is over 9,000. Gotcha. It is. Today, we'll be finally discussing a Star Wars, and it's going to be the first one in numerical order, Episode 1, The Phantom Menace. Wait, I thought we were doing the first one in release order. Oh, crap. Uh-oh. <laughs> I thought we were doing the first one in our hearts. <laughs> I thought we were only doing the ones that have the word one in them. How many is that? Rogue One. Oh. Or Rebel One? Uh, I can't remember. It's a Rogue while one. ago. Rogue, Rogue One. Rogue one. Yeah. Speaking of midichlorians, did, did anyone ever drop what their personal count was? Like, they were trying to compare, like, 20,000 is a shitload. And they're like, well, what's... What was it's like that Doctor Who meme? It's like, what? Well, how much is that? It's like, is that a lot? It's like, well, it depends. You know, serial like three, like people that have been murdered. Yes, that's a lot. But like dollars, no. <laughs> so it really, it's very subjective. I have when we get to that point, I did have um, the the current canon breakout of the the counts. Okay, I was gonna have Barry be like, Obi Wan, run this blood sample for me, and Obi Wan be like, he has a desk a desk worth of many chlorines. It's like a desk worth. <laughs> Like how much is that? <laughs> He's low on fiber, master. He has like a gill of midi chlorians. How much is a gill? <laughs> Three microtons. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> it's all midi chlorians. We're, we're going to be doing the first uh, 1999 Star Wars film, the one that we actually uh, grew up with in theaters anyway. I'm really excited to do this because I've been wanting to do a Star Wars for quite some time. and. With uh, today being May the 4th, I figured, you know what, it's a good time to release this movie on this day of all days, and especially with the 25th anniversary, it just felt like kismet, so. Made me question my reality for a second with that date, but I'm on your yeah. level. There we go. Dean, we don't record the day of. <laughs> what do you, you mean? Should. This isn't I've, a live show. <laughs> we've had a couple that were pretty close, though. <laughs> <laughs> Pulled us out, Park. Um, so I've seen this a lot. Um, has anyone else? We've all seen this before. Uh, I believe I saw this five times in theaters when it came out. Uh, I think at least twice with you. Yeah. This was a first time viewing. Is it really? <laughs> it's the only one of the series that I hadn't seen before. How do you how how of all of them <laughs> you don't see the first? That was the only <laughs> one that had hype. I grew up on the other three, but I liked them. I didn't like them enough, though, Tim to get was, my parents to Tim like, stand in line. Tim was fucking nine years old, and he still looked at that movie and the reviews the same way that the 40-year-olds did at the time of release. <laughs> like, nope, I don't want to hear it. I, I, he was already a film critic by the age of nine. He didn't like want sitting, any sitting on his couch reading like the... the what is it the like the tv movie magazines of the time i don't even remember what there was uh, like the movie phone magazine just being like i don't know movie phone only gave it a six i don't know hey if it's not for leonard moulton it's not for me no but like we didn't go to the theater often as kids um it was like a special occasion for my family and we ended up kind of using that for a movie that came out earlier that month so to the boss, it was, oh, we already went to the movies. I'm not going back again. We we went to Brendan Fraser's The Mummy and loved it. Oh. And then it was, oh, okay, like I'll catch episode one when it eventually gets to like home video. 
I mean, mummy's and not a didn't. bad choice. That's not mummy is still like a great choice. I pop that on every so often just just because it's a great movie. Yeah, I I almost go went to see it. We we got there, and this was in the time of when you had to like fight for your seats, kind of thing. There was no assigned seating, so we got there maybe like ten minutes late into the showing, and it was the theater was packed. So it's like it, if I don't get a decent seat, I'm not sitting in the front. I'm like, you know what? Let's just go, and we refunded the tickets and we went home. So. Yeah. With it coming out also in theaters, um, again, I'm kind of tempted to go see it only because it's I'd never seen it in at theaters, so it'd be kind of cool to see. Oh wait, the Mummy's also coming to theaters again? Yeah. Oh, huh. I mean, it definitely has some scenes in it that I'd love to see on a big screen. Yeah. I'll only go to I the think 35 that, print screening. I do. I do think it aged pretty well compared to some others. It's still a pretty fun movie. I don't remember the effects. Like if they're that outdated That's what I mean. or not, I feel, you think it holds up? I feel, yeah. I, think okay. I feel like there might there, there might be a couple that are like really heavy CGI that might not like the whole like face in the sand thing. Even even watching this, it there were times where like this looks really good. Wow, this looks like shit. Yeah. Oh, episode one like really in the between. gambit is like yeah. wow, this looks great. And like holy, Savalba looks bad. <laughs> yeah, I, w- I was wondering, <laughs> this was shot on film until it was no. what was it the it was this was a shot i thought it was all digital no this was the the prequels anyway this was the last one to be shot on film before then and then the force awakens was shot on film so between this and the force awakens it was digital cinema but um I, it looks like i don't know if he like watching it on disney plus on my nice tv i don't know if tried to get rid of the film look <laughs> it kind of looks like very like cl- it kind of looks clean <laughs> oh uh, oh the look i thought you meant tried to get rid of the film <laughs> there is um kind of like controversy to the disney plus version because it's not a true 4k film they upscaled it from the blu-ray scan hmm. so it's not true 4k so i've never been one of those star wars fans to like or even film viewers where if it's not i mean when it's in real 4k it it looks amazing and they didn't do that with any of the star wars films to my knowledge or at least the ones that are on disney plus i think the sequels might be in true 4k only because they're brand new but i just don't know about the prequels but i do know that it is not a true gotcha uh, 4k render which is i still th- i still think it looks fine i mean i remember watching the DVD version and then thinking like, Oh, this isn't that bad compared to the VHS and then seeing the VHS version, like, Holy shit. DVD is so much better. That's why I, I went to Google it because I was like, this looks really clean. And was this shot digitally or not? And it said, no, this was the last 35 millimeter movie until the force awakens. Gotcha. As a first time viewing, I enjoyed this. I think there were definitely it's things I wasn't. There, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like I always hear about all of these things of how much people hate Jar Jar and like Jake Lloyd's acting and all of this other stuff. I think overall, like I enjoyed it. I th- think it was solid. I was very surprised because I didn't realize the entire like first third of this movie, how they just drop into the action. And most of it was just like a 35 minutes of escape and get away before you really get into the meat of the story. Um, but I I dig it. I think Star Wars is going to be a popular thing. I have notes on Jake Lloyd, and it's nothing <laughs> against him. <laughs> Said the police. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> it, I feel, you know, there were a few... <laughs> he says one line. It is bad. And it's like, it's no fault of his. It was especially when, um, later on in the movie, when he gets um Sebulba off of what's his name's back Jar Jar's back when he's like uh, the whole thing happens and Sebulba tries to fight Jar Jar oh yeah when he like steals his food and yeah right. yeah um let me see here I'm trying to find it because I mean I think Jake Lloyd's issue was just child acting plus a terribly written script you yeah. can tell he's literally reciting what's on the page word for word well, cause it, it's true. Like the the sentences are are phrased so awkward awkwardly. Like yeah. the way they're written is really difficult and strange to say. 
And then on top of that, you're a child actor. He shines the most when he's speaking his lines in Hatiz because it's not real words. Mm, that's a good point, actually. I didn't <laughs> think of that. And he he it's it, it's seamless. But then when he switches back to English, it's just like, oh, man, it's probably like how John claude Van Damme appears to be a better actor when he's speaking French. <laughs> but we don't really you know mean his native tongue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't really know if he's acting better or not because we can't understand him, but it seems a lot better. I mean, French just also sounds better. So, like, he's got that going for him, <laughs> it's too. True. Like, there, there were scenes that seemed like odd dubbing that they did post sync, where, like, when he's cheering inside the ship towards the end of the movie, and you hear, like, yeah, but then they show his mouth, and it's just like slightly ajar, and you just hear, like, a big chair coming out of it. And it's like, oh, they definitely did that afterwards. <laughs> I feel so bad for all the shit that he got over the years. And, Honestly, for every bad thing that Jake Lloyd did in this movie, I blame George. I don't blame the kid whatsoever. Yeah, well, that's that's where it should go. He knocked it out of the park with what he was given. Hasn't it always been a problem with George that like he doesn't know how to direct act? Like I thought it was like self admittedly he doesn't know how to direct actors. It's like just go out and do your thing faster, more intense. And, um, that's it. That was his. That was his trademark line whenever he was directing is just faster more intense no he's he's a decent director he's not a good script he's not a good writer that's why the empire strikes back was so much better because he wasn't the one directing it and he also had lawrence kasdan helping him do the script writing in this case it was just him he had no one to kind of um balance him out and reel him back whenever he was going too far one of the problems with this movie, a lot of people say that he was surrounded by yes men and no one challenged anything that he said. Well, it's like I remember the rumors when this was in development that he was trying to get in sync in it because his kids wanted in sync to be in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that they were gonna do. They were gonna be. They weren't like they were gonna be dressed up like the in cantina universe. band. Like they weren't gonna be like, oh, and everyone here is in sync. But like they were just gonna like have like a, a cameo where you're like, wait, is that in sync? Yeah, I think they might have been dressed up as Jedi or something, and they would have yeah. been like Gungans. A... <laughs> yeah, Gungans would have been the best. No idea who they, they are. They just they just do it in like all together. I was they just have say, really they do smooth sync, voices. Like bye bye bye, but like with Gungan <laughs> accents. Yeah. <laughs> Misa bye. It's weird watching the sequels because of some of the cameos that are in it and just some of the acting choices because it's you're too famous to be in this movie. I don't see the character you're playing. I'm seeing Benicio del Toro, you know? Mm, that's true. Oh boy, that that's a bad one. Oh, uh, that that makes my brain hurt you when you even mention that. Wait, what? I know. He's in the Last Jedi. <laughs> you you showed that to me too. I didn't want to oh, watch it. I didn't, I didn't know, know that. I, it's one of those things where like I had to suffer. So I needed to share the, the pain. But unlike The Last Jedi, this was released on Wednesday, May 19th in 1999 to earn $924 million at the box office and eventually oh earning that $1 billion total when it was re-released in 2012 in 3D. I saw that. I don't remember the 3D. Yeah, I, was gonna say, I don't remember that either, actually. Were you one of the ones camped out days in advance in the movie line? I was, I was 13. When this came out, so no. So you, you didn't skip school. No, I my up. mom okay. my mom was like, no, we are going on Saturday. I wanted to go opening night, and she said we are going on Saturday, so we went on Saturday. <laughs> yeah, we didn't do an opening night for the prequels until the third one, I think. Right? Yeah, yeah. We mm. saw we saw episode two opening day, and we just went right after school, mm. and it was dead. And it was great. And then when we left, that's surprising. That was when the line was like outside the movie theater. Because we went at like a two or three o'clock show. And then by the time we got out, it was like five or six. And then that's when the line was, you know, the, the movie theater was packed. And it was really cool that we were able to go in without any issues. And then episode three, that's when we saw it opening. Which I guess it was a lot easier back then to not have to worry about seeing it immediately. Because you didn't really have a lot of the constant internet coming directly into your pocket all the time of hey, here's all the spoilers for the movie. It's pretty much as long as you see it before the weekend's done, before you get back to school and have friends ruin it for you, you're pretty safe. Mm. I mean, even then, that was the time of AOL. So, like, you, it, YouTube wasn't even around yet with all the, the trillions of YouTube reviewers where 
you just open YouTube and your first 10 rows of videos are just like, I reviewed the new Star Wars. I did this challenge at the new Star Wars. I, I ate 15 Cinnabons at the saw Star Wars. <laughs> See which one was the best. <laughs> the answer may shock you. And it was before that realm of like massive I'm, I'm franchises. Dead. You know, there wasn't any other like Marvel wasn't a thing at this time. And it's not like, you know, when people were camping out, you, uh, Harry Potter was a thing at the time, but it wasn't. I don't I don't know anyone. I, I watched Harry, the last Harry Potter movie um, as a midnight showing, but it wasn't like gangbusters and everyone was lining around the corner to go watch it. This was a very special thing when it came out for all the prequels, for that matter. A lot of people were mixed feelings with this one. But for the two other ones, we were of age for this exact movie, and we we devoured it. We loved it. Oh yeah, I mean, I think at the time this was one of the first like big fr like franchise re releases as well. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I guess this kind of came out in the time of like our generation's nostalgia films, so it's kind of in a weird place. But like, we we didn't have like things that were coming back mainly because like. 80s movie culture was just different than 90s movie culture so like to think that like all of a sudden this movie franchise that has been gone for like 20 years no no not actually that long um like 15 yeah. years no it was about 20 at that point oh was it okay yeah, so, so well, like, 77 well that's true yeah actually it's if anything it's less it's like probably like 15 jedi yeah because i would say jedi was what like 83, 83. or something yeah yeah you could, that's what my brain did at first. It went to the first one, and then it was like, "Oh wait, no, hold on." <laughs> yeah, no, you're. Right, um, so. But like, yeah, it, it, we 18. we weren't seeing that at the time yet. There wasn't like Casablanca two coming out all of a sudden. <laughs> no, there were no, there very, there weren't Rex any Revenge. sequels back then. If a movie got a sequel, it's because it made a shitload of money. Mm -hmm. Now it seems things are getting sequels. Like we're getting another Bad Boys movie. I I didn't ask for it. Hmm. Well, it's like wait, after Bad Boys Forever. Wasn't it Bad Boys I mean, for Life? Or which one? Was I, which bad Boys for Life, thank yeah. you, yeah. yeah. It's true, trilogies weren't really a thing. It was mm -hmm. like Star Wars, Godfather. Back to the Future. Uh, I mean, they, they existed, but it's not like, it was oh, like Shawshank a Redemption thing. was really good. Let's make a sequel to it. Like, no. But, and if there's no sequel... Be them hanging out at the beach? <laughs> <laughs> and if there's no sequel, they'll, they'll split the movie in half kind of thing, like what they did mm. with It. And it's such a different time back then so getting an additional movie such as star wars was a big deal it, it really was so you liked it as a kid yes oh no now uh -oh. i mean it, it's hard to look at it in a different way because um you know it was really touching especially when in the last star wars celebration which is for those not in the know it's just star wars like the, the official Star Wars convention hosted by Star Wars, they had Hayden Christensen come on as one of the guests and the crowd erupted and cheering. And you could tell he actually got emotional. And for years after his portrayal of Anakin Skywalker, he got the same treatment as Ahmed Best, the same treatment as Jake Lloyd. He was basically, he, he quit acting and he basically went to live on a farm <laughs> for the remaining you know, the, the next like 20 years, he just, it was that bad. And during that reception that he got, um, rather all he, he realized that all the people were too young to voice their opinion on how great and how impactful he was in their lives. And the same thing with like Ahmed best, he got a lot of shit for this movie. He went through a lot of mental health problems. He almost committed suicide. He, he was at his, the end of his rope because of just the poor treatment that he got for this role and then seeing him get that jedi role in the mandalorian i think i don't know between the all the oh, new and Disney Obi shows yeah it was obi-wan it yeah. was obi-wan yeah i get the mm -hmm. three mixed up because mando shows up in book of boba fett and and grogu shows up in obi-wan like why why is why is this happening but i'm uh, at mcu <laughs> But the fact that he's in it and he's given one of the biggest roles for this entire thing, like, that's insane. Like, that's so amazing. And he realizes that it's just now's the time that the fans that were too young to appreciate them are finally old enough to voice those opinions. I mean, don't get me wrong. This movie's not great. 
but at the time when it came out, it was the right age for us to watch it because we were the target demographic. Oh, totally. And, and like, just on that point, I just want to say, also, Ahmed Best does not deserve no. any of what he got. None of like, them. Yes. No, nobody does. Jar, like, Jar Jar Binks, yes, a bad character. Only Gina but Carano. Like, <laughs> Ahmed Best as an actor didn't, like, really horribly treated. And just on a side note, like, if anyone's, like, interested in deep diving onto, like, the Ahmed, Ahmed Best story, there's a great short podcast series put on by Ted, who does, like, the TED Talks um that talks about Ahmed Best's experience and kind of the rise of the online hate campaign because this was one of the first uh to ever exist just because how the internet was growing up at the time. So really cool series that kind of dives into how those kind of hate backlash campaigns affect an actor. It's really it cool. makes it makes me upset and really pissed off to be a Star Wars fan sometimes. Cause even mm -hmm. with the sequels, like I I am no a uh, stranger to voicing my hate for the last Jedi, but for Kelly Marie Tran to get bullied online to the point of leaving social media and all because of a character she portrayed in a movie, she had no control over anything that she did in front of the camera. She just acted what she was told to do. And people are giving her death threats over this. Like, I don't understand what's wrong with you. I don't get it. Yeah, yeah. People can't separate that. I mean, nobody should get anything, for even the writer. But it's like I can't separate that. Any other actor, it, you still wouldn't have liked it. it you, you didn't like the character and what they did with, with the story, and the yeah. and the actor doesn't deserve Which, to be publicly dragged as, through the glass. As far as you said, like it, years later, Hayden Christensen getting the recognition and uh, at Best getting the recognition and all of this. It's kind of sad that. Jake Lloyd following all of this did like this he jingled all the way he did a couple other things but then he ended up retiring from acting and then like 2008 he was diagnosed as paranoid schizophrenia and over the years he's had a lot of troubles like with the the law and struggling with mental health and all of this that I don't think we're gonna see the Star Wars Disney Plus miniseries where they like cast him to come back and do something that he gets that same kind of oh like here's your big moment now after 20 years where people realize how much they appreciate what you've done for the uh franchise so it's unfortunately this is all we have with him really right well i mean it would also be weird to have like 40 year old 12 year old anakin skywalker appear yeah. <laughs> same costume I'm, I'm just like with. they wear like shorts now i'm good with uh hayden filling in the role it's it's weird because he doesn't look like he's you know 20 years old anymore but i'll i'll take it yeah well i mean I we mean, can I, still I, recast him as something kind of like how they had ahmed best come mm, back and just be a jedi master i mean the fact mm, that they put true. him in the vader suit say what you will about the obi-wan show it, the, that last fight scene regardless if you, if you think it should have been there or not because it's a story that didn't need to be told so to speak, but I loved that line where his helmet gets broken open and, you know, and he tells Obi-Wan, like, You didn't kill Anakin Skywalker. Skywalker. I did. And that's Hayden saying this and, like, chills. And I get chills every single time I think of it and see that scene whenever it comes up on TikTok and just, it's, it's an amazingly well done shot. He did a fantastic job and I'm so happy to see that it's actually him behind the mask and it's not just you know somebody else mm. right like they could have just like cgi'd a face and had a different actor do it yeah hayden was great in it though like i thought he did a great job he really i mean personally i loved the obi-wan series i thought it was great one of the better star wars series but my question is why do we not get a prequel of r2d2 because in this movie we established that r2d2 like before he even got involved with the skywalkers was already out there like saving people and doing things that that's a story that has more stuff to tell <laughs> all the side event all the side adventures that r2 has been on for the yeah. like i don't know 70 years this droid has been active and <laughs> yeah. it's not canon anymore but they made a cartoon show called droids with r2 and 3po oh, it's that's supposed right. to happen before they were purchased by um um captain antilles and you see him on the you see them on the tantive four at the beginning of a new hope 
Never watched the show. It was definitely before our time. We were on the very cusp of Ewoks when that was. Yeah, a, I remember. A show. I think I remember seeing like the VHS cover of Droids and being like, "Oh, huh." Yeah, never, I think yeah. it's on Disney Plus, but I I don't want to watch that. <laughs> Does the same woman that voices Toad still do R two D two? Toad from Mario. <laughs> Whoa! Oh, the screaming is like pretty similar. Yeah. <laughs> So nothing compared or stood a chance that released near it. So um, it, this didn't release with anything else. I mean, I think that was probably intentional. Yeah, Studios nobody, yeah. were like, nobody oh, wait, Star the... Wars is coming back with a new movie? No, yeah, we'll, we'll move ours. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that, that, that shit's just like GTA. Just like, no, nah, we're not releasing anything this month. <laughs> nope. So um, the other movies that released in May, um, or at least way before it, was we have A Midsummer Night's Dream with Kevin Klein, Michelle Pfeiffer. That movie caught my eye that came out on May 14th and um, Notting Hill came out on May 28th and uh, The Mummy was the only other big blockbuster that month. I don't know if it came out in like when in May it came out, but it was close enough. Yeah, I think it was May 9th or something. It was uh, a week before or like a week and a half before Star yeah. Wars. Yeah, and that that one made um uh 416 million worldwide so that's um the only other big one the other two i didn't even write down their numbers because it was not anything in comparison we're dealing with numbers so big because it's star wars that oh yeah notting hill made 116 million like that's that's nice <laughs> yeah this cast is huge this star is ewan mcgregor liam neeson natalie portman and of course with all the prequel hate with the conversation we just had those three are never brought up in any of those conversations but um this cast um is huge and it does have a lot of returning star wars alumni with some newer additions um kenny breaker returned for r2d2 anthony daniels for c3po I'm trying to think of who else might have come back uh, frank brian oz. oh yeah uh, frank oz did yep brian blessed is in this this is where i know him from fly <laughs> And I can definitely hear it. And then in hindsight, now knowing Flash Gordon and the amazing role that he did in that movie, I really wish Boss Nass was in the Gungan battle at the end of the movie. <laughs> we make you a bomb bad general. And then that's it. We never see him again until the very end of the movie. Like, damn, I wish they included him and had him do like some crazy stuff. Cause A true bureaucrat. Anyway, gotta go. <laughs> So George Lucas is well known at this point for constantly changing his finished films, and this was no stranger to it. Um, though it's not in the same vein compared to like the original trilogy, because just a few years before, um, in 1997, if I'm not mistaken, he re-released the original trilogy in movies, and he deemed them the special editions, and he added scenes, he recut um, things that were deleted into the movie um he changed the way that some scenes were actually done um so like when they're walking around cloud city for instance you actually see through the windows into the background and you see like how beautiful cloud city is whereas in the original 1977 version um you know those scenes the they're just white walls you don't see there are no windows windows baked into the walls it's just a flat white surface kind of thing you know mm -hmm. so some things are just purely cosmetic and then others are much bigger that caused controversy and changes and the this movie is also one of them where it's not he he did do some stuff hmm. do you do you know if that if that special edition was that when they introduced the scene or i guess brought back in the scene that they had cut that had han intimidating java yes okay i wasn't sure if that was later or not but i remember that being like a really big addition yeah. and a scene that actually worked better than i expected but <laughs> That also has changed, I think, three times as well since mm. it came out in the in the 90s. The original version, the coloring was off. And then in the DVD version, they changed it. And then they changed it again um, in, the, 
in the Blu-ray version, I think, as well. The Disney Plus version uses the one that's on the Blu-ray. So the Disney Plus version uses the one that's on the Blu-ray. So in The Phantom Menace, at least, Yoda was originally a puppet, and they replaced him with the CGI model that is exactly the same that you see in Episode 2 and 3. Um, and the pod race scene is much longer as well. Um, they added, like, one little thing that happens to Anakin in this one that wasn't in the theatrical cut, and there's, like, maybe one or two small 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 things like when they arrive on Coruscant you see them like take the taxi ride to Palpatine's apartment kind of thing like it's it's super small but um I can't think of anything else that was really added to it besides that I mean I I personally liked some of the things they added to the pod race I did too um, like there's I, a, it, and the pod race scene is even longer because there is a full uncut version where they introduce every single racer and it is extended in this cut, but it's not the entirety of it. And I think there's a couple more shots that were removed that were not added into the extended cut. So there's still more pod mm. race that is not officially released, but it is there. I just remember it being funny because like back when I was watching this movie a lot, because there were times I remember you and I at your house, we would just watch this movie every time we got together. Yeah. Um, that I would be like, oh man, this movie would be great, but the pod race is so boring. <laughs> um, but now that it's been many years since I watched it and I saw it and I was like, oh, the pod race is pretty cool. I kind of like how they added more to it. Yeah. <laughs> and then it got me thinking that like when they do like, you know, they have a, a bridged introduction of all the pod racers. It's not quite as long as like, I think they originally wanted it. But like I liked some of that. It gave you more background. It did a bit more world building for it. And I think it actually benefits from some of that. Also, like embellishing like Anakin's mechanical issue during the pod race. Like in the original theatrical, it's like this very quick thing where it's just like, oh yeah, ha, ha, it's done. But in the extended, like you actually see what happens and it's much more serious and you see him like having to like physically fix it. Um, it just like added so much more to to the world of what pod racing is rather than just like oh hey it's this race like go well also we get to see more of like anakin's technical ability and mm -hmm. it's not just oh it's just he's magic he has jedi power it's like no also like he's really good with the machines and he's a technical whiz so it's like regardless if he was adopted by the jedi he probably still would have ended up like making a name for himself just out of his technical ability there's a lot of i i it it's really hard to be a Star Wars fan nowadays because when it comes to the sequels, Rey is considered a Mary Sue. And so many times I try to think back on Luke and Anakin and she has the same story as they do where you go from poverty stricken orphan and then their, you know, adventure and um, just a grand a grand adventure is thrust upon them and then they just you know the chosen one motif that kind of thing and you know did they go through the same thing as ray and is it justified to call her a mary sue versus anakin and just i don't know like when i see all this stuff with anakin it's just i see the progression and everything that they've said about him leading up to this point in time because all we knew about anakin at this point is he was the best starfighter pilot in the galaxy and a cunning warrior that's it that's all we knew about him and at this point, he's nine. I'm like, okay, what the hell is this kid going to do? I don't like the the ending bit with him flying around in the Starfighter and he just fails upward and destroying a massive capital ship by just, oops, the engine overheated. And then just he's, you know, two minutes later, he's destroying it without realizing it kind of thing. Right. And it just, it also just happens to be the droid control ship, like of, of the many ships in the blockade. It just, happens to be the main one <laughs> and yeah. his ship ends up powering down aimed at the main reactor already <laughs> yeah i mean it's like he's magooing his way through that and jar jar's doing the same thing down on the ground level and it's like so did anybody win this war by just being good I, you know I, I wonder if that's the oh, thing wow. maybe, maybe that's the the dividing factor where it's like anakin succeeds at everything effortlessly by mistake and Ray does it, but is confident in it. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the way they approach it. <laughs> and plus with him fixing the pod racer as he's spinning out of control, like that's his ship. He knows oh, yeah, it. Oh yeah, that from makes the, sense. He, may, he, he built it from the ground up. And 
when he's spinning out of control, he's calm, collected, and he's able to fix it and keep going. This girl shows up on a freighter that she's never been in, piloted ever, and she's able to fix it and fly it within seconds. It's just like, that seems a little weird to me. Even Anakin was like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'll try Ray, spitting. That's a good trick. Didn't Ray have 40,000 midichlorians, though? I don't have her. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I mean, I think that's that's part of it. It's just the attitude towards it. If if Ray like grabbed the controls and was like, I mean, I guess I'll try. I think maybe people would have had like a different reaction to her. Or if she bumbled her way around, you know, like I don't yeah, know. a little bit, or, or just showed some like maybe she did. Novice, I don't remember. Yeah, like or naivete. Uh, naivete. Yeah, we can naivete. 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 But I guess it's 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 also kind of like the age thing, right? Like Anakin's like a little kid, so everyone just expects him to like do bad. <laughs> so he's just like, oh, he's magooing his way through this. And Ray's, you know, <laughs> older at that point, so maybe it wouldn't translate well if she was just like kind of a bumbling idiot, but kind of working it out. Well, also, I wonder if it's just as viewers of entertainment, we've come to just get tired of that bit that it's like we've seen it so many times. It's if they just bumbled their way through and still won we no longer will sit by and be like, okay, yeah, that's still fun. It's like, no, now we're just tired of it. So she needs to be good at her job. But then we also, <laughs> not we, I don't want to say it. I, I don't mind Ray. I liked um, parts of this. I just wish, uh, my main complaint was I felt like Anakin, we get to see grow up and we understand like how he came into these powers and things like that over time. Ray, because they end up having such an accelerated feel of the movies. There's no aging. There's no like transition. So it's just kind of like it. F I know they do like some time jumps, but it's not that long. And ultimately, it just feels like, wait, so she just came into being super good at being a Jedi over mm -hmm. the course of a few weeks. Yeah, um, the, the, the writing demanded that the character had to be good at this already. Yeah. So my issue isn't necessarily Ray. It's like I would have liked to have seen like a better way of handling that writing wise. I don't like watching a lot of those YouTubes or reading the articles of like, this is how I would have written these movies instead and still keeping all of the actual content, but just changing a few things to make it more make more sense. Only because it's like, what's done is done. We can't change it. You can write the best fan fiction in the world, and it's not going to change anything. But I do blame the writing on a lot of what current Star Wars is and a lot of the complaints. And it's just, the, it, and I feel it's the same problem with Marvel in that the people making the content aren't fans themselves. And the stu there's too much studio interference that doesn't understand the property they have, and they're not making the product that people want. They're trying to cater too many to too many people and they're not just focusing on like look let's make this for the star wars fans if we make a good movie along the way other people are going to see it as well no i think that's a good point because like it, it to bring like obi-wan the show back up again like i feel like obi-wan was was a show for the fans and succeeded at it whereas kind of the the new movies were more trying to like find that gap where they're like oh we need to bring in the new audience like the prequels did for us like how episode one brought us into star wars like we all liked star wars already but like episode one kind of brought us in at that age when we were like 12 13 14 well i think um, it was the first star wars for you right like and so like so like, like the, made for you in mind yeah. right so like the the new movies were both trying to be like hey we want to do that again but also now we have this other generation of the, the the prequel generation that we also have to like try and make happy, but also we need to bring new Star Wars fans. Yeah, it's and too many. It, it's too much crowd pleasing and it's and it's detracting from the product they're making. Because yeah. I've had nightmares over that concept of like, am I the 40 year old that's getting pissed off about those the sequels? As the 40 year old, I'm not 40, but you know. Yeah, I was gonna um, say, wait a second, you're not 40. <laughs> no, but like, am I the person that was complaining about the prequels, but now I'm the one complaining about the sequels when they came out? Like, oh, I prefer Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader and that story and all of this prequel nonsense is, is stupid and it's not well done. Am I doing the same thing now for the sequels? And I'm trying so hard to embrace it and it's 
there are some moments where it's just I cringe and it's mainly because of not the actors, but it's just bad writing. I wouldn't have done it this way. I wouldn't have focused on it this way. And I know you're about to say something. The last thing I will say is, um, David, I, I, I'll agree with you to the extent of I think Andor was the show that was meant for Star Wars fans, not Obi-Wan. I liked it a lot, but Andor made so much waves for those that don't even like Star Wars in a good way. That is what people are really hoping and looking for the most, I think. I was going to say, as the resident non-Star Wars uh, fan, I guess you could say, um, I don't, I didn't enjoy like the sequels all that much, personally. So I don't think you necessarily are coming from a place of nostalgia. I, mean, I just yeah, I mean, don't think I... they were great movies. I remember when the credits rolled for The Last Jedi, everyone looked at me and I'm like, I don't know what to say. I'm not happy. <laughs> it was it was tough. That rocked me so hard. It it really I I used to be so much more of a Star Wars fan and then after The Last Jedi it really fucked with me. But that's a different podcast. <laughs> so a long time ago in a movie theater probably closed down by now. Oh, definitely closed down by now. I think it was closing <laughs> when I was at it. Did yeah. crawl in 1999? Probably eight. <laughs> so that, that we get hit with that Star Wars logo, the fanfare, the 20th Century Fox, which is definitely one of the best parts. It's not a part of the theme, but that 20th Century Fox theme, you got to play it in front of the, the Star Wars intro. You, you have to. So the crawl starts going up. You know, turmoil has engulfed the fandom of Star Wars fans of the 70s. Taxation of trade routes and other political jargon has stopped all fans in the tracks in local movie theaters. Uh, meanwhile, the children lined up with their parents to eagerly await what is to come. Only they will be able to settle the conflict years later. And that's my take on the. I was crawl. really confused by that opening crawl. I was going to say, Nick even started getting softer at the end of his crawl, like the real crawl would do. Yeah. I just, I just got to say, that opening crawl, so my wife had never seen Star Wars. Any oh, of them, the, I, like, I like and, hearing uh, the, the takes on this, so what, what did she say? And, and so a number of years back, maybe, maybe like four or five years back, I was like, we're going to watch it, and we're going to watch it in numerical order. Because I think that could be a really interesting yeah. experience. Um, and I think that was the last time I watched episode one. And I remember starting the movie and we were reading through the, like watching the opening crawl started. And because I am watching it as like a super fan who is now seeing someone watch it for the first time. And the amount of dread I immediately <laughs> felt because I was reading this and I was like, holy shit this doesn't make any sense <laughs> and i was just like i was just like putting like that emotion onto her and being like in my head being like oh god this doesn't make any sense what is this even about and i'm just intuiting that like she's looking at this being like what is Did this you like it's this like the trade dispute and they do <laughs> The, the the trade dispute and the taxation that they're like oh my god this is total garbage <laughs> and you saw this when you were 12 right <laughs> <laughs> and this excited you when you were 12 <laughs> in taxation 1999 trade routes huh? <laughs> bureaucracy politics okay yeah it's just like watching watching this movie through the eyes of someone who's never seen it it is a confusing <laughs> mess but for those not in the know there are several ways that you can watch the star wars saga Obviously, you have the numerical order. You watch episode one, episode two, episode three, and then four, five, and six, and then, you know, the sequels. You can do it that way. You can watch them in theatrical order. So you watch four, five, and six, then you watch the prequels, then you watch the sequels. Theatrically, this keeps a lot of the twists and turns that obviously watching a prequel would ruin if you watch the prequels first because they were made later. And then you have something called the machete order where you watch four and five and that's where you get the big reveal with Darth Vader. And then you watch one, two, and three and you see his rise from Anakin to Darth Vader. And then you finish it up with Return of the Jedi and you see the full conclusion to the saga. And then you watch, you know, the sequels because they, yeah, it's, it's like having a, a, it's like having a massive extended flashback. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's another version yeah. where you just cut out episode one entirely and you still do the machete order because you still basically get the same thing 
the only thing that you need to be told in advance is, oh, yeah, the little kid has the hots for the actress, Natalie Portman. I mean, that's honest, all you really need to know. I mean, honestly, that's the kind of funny thing about episode one. The story has not a lot to do with the rest of everything. It's just like, hey, here's Anakin. <laughs> yeah, I like how a movie for basically it's the Sky, the Skywalker saga. He, the kid's barely in it. Yeah, it's like, oh, hey, here he is. It's like, oh, that's cool. I'll never not be able to think of Patton Oswalt's bit on <laughs> George oh, Lucas yeah. showing the little kid versions of characters. Go and look that up uh, after you're done listening to this. Oh, I was thinking of like the the um, filibuster with oh, Parks and Rex. Yeah, yeah. He has a bit about George, like, "Hey, you like you like Darth Vader? Yeah, I love him. And now you get to see him as a little kid. <laughs> Yippee! <laughs> Do you like Boba Fett?" Now you get to see him as a little kid. <laughs> oh, I, wanna, I want Mace Windu as a little kid. That's what I want to see. Ooh, oh, a Mace series. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see the scene when Mace Windu demands that he has a purple lightsaber. That's <laughs> so like, but Mace, no one, no one has a purple lightsaber. <laughs> purple lightsaber, you will not have. So actually, now I'm trying to think because I didn't write down the real crawl. And uh, to summarize. Uh, there is a um, the actual point of the movie trade dispute is a trade about dispute. taxation. Yes. So the trade federation, which is just like a, a clan of just they they do trade. <laughs> I get it. A, a federation, if you will, about trade. <laughs> <laughs> and they set up a, a blockade and an embargo and the Republic, the uh, reigning government in the galaxy, has sent uh, two ambassadors to the Trade Federation uh, ship um, that's blockading the planet to just start peace talks and try to de-escalate the entire situation. So here we see a ship fly by and it has those two representatives of the Republic to go over, you know, the blockade. The ship lands, and this is where we meet for the first time Obi-Wan Kenobi, a Padawan, and played by Ewan McGregor, to his master Qui-Gon Jinn, played by Liam Neeson. Um, they're brought to a conference room, and then uh, once they're in that conference room, we uh, cut over to the Viceroy of the Trade Federation, Newt Gunray, and he realizes that the Ambassadors are actually Jedi Knights. And... Um, at the thought of this, he decides, you know what, instead of trying to deal with this, just send the droids in there and kill them. And he's going to contact Lord Sidious. Which which is so funny that, like, they sent Jedi to negotiate, which it kind of feels like a double cross, right? That would be like, hey, we're going to go negotiate this. We sent in two Navy SEALs to negotiate it. <laughs> <laughs> we sent our best diplomats, Skull yeah. Destroyer and Kills a lot. It's like, and, that gonna... st- and on top of that, they're basically psychics. Right. So yeah, they yeah. Could, uh, couldn't Who they have told them minds? to accept this? Accept it's like, this, this doesn't. This doesn't feel honest. <laughs> it's like I understand that like it's not supposed to be, but like it's almost I, like the Jedi as a order are not great. <laughs> I do like how the Viceroy reacts. Like, oh shit! Oh fuck! Like we are fucked. <laughs> like, we're not going in there. Dean, what version did you see? <laughs> uh, when I made this version, I really thought that it would be fun if we uh, really had them react correctly. I, I will say, the... though, like, to this day, those battle droids look great. I I miss these battle droids the most. They <laughs> They sound awesome. I hate how they made them sound so nasally mm. in the second and third one. And this one, it's like, they sounded, I would be afraid to go up against them. They weren't no Terminator or like the automatons from Helldivers in that kind of like menacing sort of way, but just they didn't sound like a joke to you kind yeah. of thing. By the come the second and third one in the Clone Wars especially, they're just cannon fodder for the Jedi. And in this one, they really didn't feel like it. Yeah, well, there was also the, uh, there was an animated movie. I can't remember. Oh, maybe it was, um, maybe it was a Clone Wars movie. Is that what it's called? I can't remember. Um, where the droids were featured very, very heavily. And they were just like slapstick comic relief, like the whole way through. Yeah. And it's too bad. I mean, I, I get it. The canon, the canon reason to this is during this time, the droids had more power devoted to all of their systems because they're governed by a central computer on a ship 
whereas um, come the Clone Wars, they're much more automated and they had to basically add more room for that automation and independence and it cut into their vocal chips. And that's why they sound like, eh. That's a, that's a pretty loose. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, I can't do that voice, but yeah. No, no, I don't mean the voice. I mean the explanation. Like, that's... that's hmm. All right. <laughs> so, Gunray decides, I'm not going to deal with the Jedi. Let's just kill them. So, immediately in the hangar, the turret defenses kick in, and it destroys the ship the Jedi arrived in, and then poisonous gas fills in the room, and the Jedi sense, like, the, or they probably felt, because that, that was a big explosion. So um, they stand up from their seats, lightsabers light up, and then just as, like, the, oh, no, it's, like, bad gas, they hold their breath. And I really like this scene where, you know, like, the, all the battle droids show up and they aim their guns, and um, the doors open, and you just see the gas, and then, one like, one droid looks to the other, and he's like, Check it out, Corporal, we'll cover you. Roger, roger. And then just as, he, like, they come out, the, you can see the lightsabers show up in the gas. I love that bit, and it was one of the, at least for me as a kid, growing up watching the original Star Wars movies, the lightsaber combat was very slow. You understood that they were deadly weapons, but um, George treated them like they were heavy two-handed swords in the original yeah, ones. I was going to say his direction was was always like to to imagine that it's really heavy. Yeah. In this one, it's not heavy at all. They're, they are using one-handed swords that are light as a feather and you are seeing them use them to the highest degree of power and it is kind of twirls flips yeah it's a real real big switch in direction on how lightsabers even the look of the blades i liked the kind of like thinner sleeker blade look that they use for the lightsabers in this oh so i guess you what you just see obi-wan take a deep breath and that's okay so they hold their breath okay because i was wondering like how so why aren't they dead it's a force power (laughs) one of those force breath one of one of those weird fringe Jedi powers where they can just control like their it's like, like heart- Superman throwing his logo. Yeah, like <laughs> their their like heart rate and like metabolism, and they well, can just slow their. And then directly following this scene, all of a sudden they just like use force speed and they just flash run their way through something. And I was like, wait a second, since when can they do this? Tim, they needed to have powers well, so, for the video games. They needed it's like a force power show. set. <laughs> Hey, kid, it ain't that kind of movie. <laughs> and second of all, don't tell Anakin that they figured out how to do force healing, because that would have <laughs> fixed everything <laughs> after this point in time. <laughs> I mean, it's the, the problem that I have with a lot of prequel movies in general is introducing concepts and like technology and things that you didn't have in the later stuff. So it's like, wait, so all of this is common practice, but then in the other three movies, nobody had access to this. So it's you have to just roll with it and enjoy it, but also it's like it yeah. could have been a writing thing. I mean, you made the other three. I'm totally with you on the technology thing. I think they get away with the Jedi thing because we don't see like a super adept Jedi. I mean, Darth Vader should have some of these things theoretically, but I guess he's also extremely old at this point. He's way past his heyday. You Everyone know he's is forty, right? Yeah, he seems like he's sixty. <laughs> it's James Earl Jones' voice. That's why. The, that's the, uh, the the canon response is is his midi chlorian count is over twenty thousand. Um, as Anakin Skywalker, but as Darth Vader the cyborg, it is much less because he doesn't have mm. body parts anymore. That makes sense. But like, you literally, I, don't I, have I, those I think about like comic book Darth Vader, who is just wrecking house um like during during the storylines when they're like doing the jedi hunting and is just like decimating and then in like return of the jedi and stuff he's kind of like an old man it feels like like in in the obi-wan show where we see it happen in the clone wars we see it happen in the rise of skywalker and we see it in um the Obi-Wan show where someone reaches out with the force and tries to grab an escaping ship. Mm. Ahsoka does that in the finale of the Clone Wars. She almost succeeds, but she's not quite there yet. Rey fucks up entirely. And then Vader is the only one that he pulls that shit out of the sky and he rips the side open. He is not fucking around. 
Yeah, it definitely feels like there's two different Vaders. Yeah. Um, George's I mean, explanation for all of this is just we've never seen Jedi in their true prime before, right, and this right. is what it would look like. That makes sense. Vader was toying with Luke the entire time. And then um, since Star Wars, the original A New Hope is basically based off of, you know, like all the Kurosawa films and Seven Samurai, it's just two masters of their craft facing off against each other. And it's not going to be flashy. It's just, I know what you're capable of. I'm going to do the bare minimum because I know you're going to do the bare minimum because we can, we're just that good. Hmm. I mean, that's kind of how it was approached as well in um, trying to remember which show it was when uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Maul face each other again. Yeah, Rebels. And Re oh, it was Rebels? It's a, it was a very similar. Yeah, everyone was expecting it to be this like huge grand fight. And it was just, uh, you know, it was like block, you know, swing, swing, block, block. And then he gets cut in half. It's a it, like the three move fight and that's it yeah but it's very very samurai very i i liked how they handled that when you mentioned how tim like oh they should just roll with it i wish droidicas showed up a bit more often because with how deadly they are um it made the jedi run away with force speed because as they were <laughs> trying to uh they, i mean they were cutting up all the droids like left and right they made their way to the bridge qui-gon does that cool shit where he stabs the lightsaber through the door and he's basically cutting it open while yeah. um, Obi-Wan is defending. And that's when the dro droidicas roll up and um, they do come into play later on. So just to explain them quick, they're rolling battle tanks with shields and they just shoot through the shield. You can see the guns like sticking the just terror outside of it. Battlefront too. I mean, it's real, yeah. real effective, real effective. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why they don't use them more often. Maybe the, maybe the shield generators are just really... I mean, the Gungans, though, they have shield generators coming out of every orifice. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so when so the, they utilize force retreat. Yeah, the one and only time. They, they just specced uh, into it on their skill tree. <laughs> <laughs> All bored. of a sudden, Obi-Wan's eyes roll back, and it's like, what are you doing, respecking? <laughs> and I was like, well, I mean, Jedi power battles. Yeah, yeah. What do, you, do you think... Qui-Gon for literally forced um Obi-Wan to do that? Like were they, were they that intuitive? I guess they can be in sync maybe probably with their feelings. I, I like, boom, I, we're both gonna force down here like at the same time. I like time. the thought that like Liam Neeson just like force pushed himself and also force pulled <laughs> Qui-Gon <laughs> or uh Obi-Wan. Obi Wan. Yeah, it's just like a really like unique way of using force pull and push. It's it's like the iceman of the Star Wars universe. It's like, just well, be creative it's like, with it. Yeah, it's kind of like so in the the new X Men ninety seven in the first episode of the the new X Men show, mm. they show Cyclops using his optic blasts to Hell like yeah. move him around. So he like hits a guy, punches another one, uses a force blast to shoot a guy and propel him around to move into position for a flank. And it's like this is the kind of stuff of use your power, but use it like in cool new ways we haven't seen yet. But yeah, that's the the force push pull. That's not just like, oh, throw a guy. I'm going to pull that wall to me. Wait, what? <laughs> I'm going to pull that guy's heart towards me, <laughs> but push his body away from me. <laughs> George Lucas is like, well, I saw it in another film. <laughs> Viceroy, cover your heart. Not that say, Dr. Jones. <laughs> so this movie bounces around a lot and there's pretty much like four major set pieces that were always like kind of balancing around between Darth Sidious and talking with um, the Viceroy, the Queen, the Jedi. And, um, you know, we kind of bounce around between the, those three constantly. So um, just as the Jedi are fleeing and they stow away on the, sh um, the landing ships because they realize that, you know, they're about to be invaded on the planet. We meet Queen Amidala elected ruler of the Naboo. Um, she's played by Natalie Portman, and she's only like 15, 16 in this, so. Really? I mean, she does look pretty young. I forget how, like, she hasn't been acting, like, forever. Yeah. It's, um... That age difference kills me. 
because Anakin's like nine and she's like sixteen here. But anyway, um, we meet uh, <laughs> we meet Queen Amidala, and she's talking with um, the sen- her senator of the planet, Sheev Palpatine. And that's when communications are cut from Coruscant, the capital city of the Republic. And then this makes them realize, like, oh, no, we could only mean one thing, invasion. So cue the uh, shot from space, and we see from the space blockade, we see massive troop transports go from the hangars of the droid ships um, down to the planet. And then that's where we see um, tanks, multi-troop transports, and droid squads beginning to gather like out in the forest and stuff. And then um, from one of the droids is um, a holographic projection thing. Um, you see Gunray ordering the droids to look for the Jedi because they weren't found on the ship. Uh, we cut to Qui-Gon. He's running from an MTT, and he tackles down one of the locals named Jar Jar, um, at best, and then is uh, reunited with Obi-Wan. And then because Jar Jar was saved by Qui-Gon, he swears a life debt to him. They just hand those out left and right. He was forced into that life debt. <laughs> <laughs> I saved your life, so that means it's mine now by Jedi Code. I didn't want to have a life debt, but now I have to. <laughs> Misa would rather die. <laughs> so Jar Jar tells the Jedi that the Gungans can help them get to Theed, the capital of Naboo, and that's where they need to go, and brings them before his leadership in um, the cool, uh, what the hell is it called? Odo Gunga, and it's their big city underwater, and I thought that was a really cool, just say what you will about the prequels, George was very, very good at like, I'm going to show you really unique, interesting locations constantly. Oh, yeah. I did. I loved this city and that whole sequence. And then like the whole underwater when they have the the colossal fish and like all this other stuff. I loved this. Oh, yeah. It's a shame that they don't make use of this more in Mm. other media for Star Wars of give me this in one of the games that I can like go explore and do stuff in. The, the visualization and like the whole narrative of the Gungan city being hidden underwater with the shield generators is so cool. Um, I also love that the whole sequence of um, Jar Jar explaining why he was exiled is like <laughs> his blade so well because he like he says it so fast and like his Jar Jar's accent is so heavy that you're like you know the things on the shield and boom and yeah but if you if you like and I've seen like someone like transcribe it and like you know you slow it down and it's like oh. He crashed a ship into the city's shield generator and dropped the shields on the whole city. Yeah, it's a good reason. That's a really Flooding good reason. Flooding the city in its entirety. <laughs> that is yeah. why he was exit. Well, I like how he starts with like, well, what happened? It's like, oh, I was like exiled because I was clumsy. It's like, no, you need to explain more. <laughs> yeah. And then he just like, he like rushes through it. And it's like, I remember in the first couple watches, I'm like, I am like, oh, yeah, whatever. But then you like really listen and you're like wait a second <laughs> i was clumsy millions dead what, what was the second part jar jar <laughs> he has like this roger rabbit energy in this mm, movie he does i'm kind of sad that the fan theory of jar jar binks being the secret sith lord didn't pan out <laughs> because he fails upward too often and just the way that he happens to be at the right place at the right time, not to mention also being the one to basically help create the Galactic Empire. Um, I mean, he fails think... upward better than Anakin does. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing that I really, I would have liked them to change, and this also gets in more towards the end too, I would have liked if Jar Jar stayed as a cowardly character who is trying to do good and then like occasionally overcomes the cowardice to do something as opposed to, Oh, he's a cowardly character who sometimes just like bumbles his way into doing stuff effect. Yeah. It just, he magoos his way into things. It's like, no, rather than him, like, Oh, he's trying to run away. And then he trips and happens to fall into a pile of bombs that then blows up and kills these other guys. And like, everybody happens to miss him. It's like, I would rather have Jar Jar get redeemed of, 
no, Jar Jar is a coward, but Jar Jar also does want to help. Can you imagine the battle sequence if like Jar Jar starts to run from a tank and all of a sudden he stops and he's like, no, not this time. <laughs> and then he turns around in front of the tank and then they pull out and it's like the Tiananmen Square picture. <laughs> and he just has like one of those boobles, I think they're called, in his hand and he just like, <laughs> just like dives into the tank. Jar Jar opens his vest and he has a bunch of them and they're like, run! <laughs> He has a couple episodes in the Clone Wars, and they're all just, they're all, yeah, that's, that's all he does the whole time. I think he pretends to be a Jedi at one point, and um, he goes on a mission with Mace Windu, and Mace is nowhere to be found, and they know that there's a Jedi somewhere, and he pretends to be the Jedi, and it, it was an amusing episode to the least, but it was, yeah, like, it's still him doing the same exact thing, even on, the, even on that point if they wanted him to be comedy relief jar jar is a funnier character if he's just like an exasperated coward who doesn't want to be doing things but because of the life debt and him constantly failing upward he gets dragged into more and more stuff and occasionally does have to do something as opposed to like he's just kind of just living his life out in this world getting dragged into stuff willy-nilly and then one day he becomes a senator <laughs> <laughs> That's all that happens in America. <laughs> <laughs> Please stop voting for Jar Jar. <laughs> it's like, what? Vote for Jar Jar? <laughs> He's the hero of the Battle of Naboo. After everything happens um, in the book Aftermath, and it's like the path to The Force Awakens, or at least that was what like the, the current marketing trend was just before The Force Awakens came out. It explains Jar Jar's fate. And after um, the rise of the Empire, people still treated him very poorly because he helped basically create it. It was him that kind of was the final straw, in the, uh, final nail in the coffin. He basically becomes like a sad street performer in Naboo and nobody pays him any mind. And he has basically like a hat out for tips and he barely gets anything. Little kid goes up to him and asks, like, yeah, so what's your story? And he explains everything. And it's just it's really sad on how that's that's where Jar Jar is at this point in time. That's pretty rough. Poor Jar Jar. I can't imagine how exhausted that would have been swimming down to the city. I would have needed a break after that. Oh yeah. Especially how they're so far down there's no light penetrating yeah. from the surface. <laughs> Quiet <I'm> not <laughs> even winded. <laughs> <laughs> I like how all their clothes are instantly dry as well. Oh, yeah. Those some nifty shoes. Well, he used force dry. <laughs> I mean, Ewan's pretty, um, he's pretty damp. At least his, his head and hair. He, he did that for uh, the women. Yeah, the clothes were, though. <laughs> Qui-Gon, is this not an abuse of our powers? Force <laughs> shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> So actually, you know, Qui-Gon's actually pretty liberal with his force usage, too, because as they're talking to Boss Nass and explaining to them, like, look, we need to get the feed quickly. Boss Nass is like, kick rocks. I don't want to help you. And um, he tries he uses the, the Jedi mind trick on him. And then it's like, you know what? Um, no, don't kick rocks. I'll I'm going to give you the best speeder we have. And it's going to let you get through the planet core to get the feed in the fastest way possible. And I mean, Qui-Gon is like a rebel. Like he really is, he is. and, and like, he, he does end up running that like gray yeah. somewhere in there. Like yeah. he throughout this movie, and we see in like the you know in the future movies when people kind of reference him, that like yeah he really kind of just did whatever he wanted. Well, I like how even when he ends up later when they get Anakin and he ends up telling the Council of I'm going to take him on as a Padawan, and they're like no you already have one that's against the rules. He's like. Then I'm going to do it with or without your consent. And it's like, yeah, you go, Qui-Gon. Yeah. I've got a certain set of skills. <laughs> i to teach this boy. <laughs> and going to stop all your hearts. Especially compared to the dynamic that Obi-Wan had with Anakin, we don't see many other examples of uh, the master-apprentice relationship. Mm. So to see, or even just Jedi in general, by the time we watch the Clone Wars, they are so much more... Um, lawful good compared to you know um, lawful what is it like lawful like uh, lawful neutral neutral yeah. good that Qui-Gon definitely is because he still plays by the rules he's, but he is willing to 
I think when he files his expense report and says that he basically bet a starship against some seedy junk dealer on a backwater planet, I think he's probably going to get pulled into a one-on-one for that. Well, unless he was planning on like, hey, if this doesn't work out, I'm just going to walk back to the ship. Obi-Wan's going to come in and he's just going to go off the chain on all the people in this building. <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't just call back to the Jedi Council and be like, yo, we, we need a pickup. They couldn't have done that. <laughs> Help us. We're poor. Um, so I like how Jar Jar um, is going to stay behind and get punished for his transgressions against the Gungan people. And that's when he gets the life debt to Qui-Gon. And he just says the line, any help here would be hot. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> There's some lines through this movie that I forget they exist. I just see it as like face value for what it is, but thinking about it, just like that out of context, it's just, yeah, it's great. P.S. The Gungans are of two races. <laughs> the the Ankura and the Otola. Ah. Found that on Wikipedia. Wikipedia, bro. Just Google and then Google's AI aggregating information. Not sponsored. <laughs> I was uh, Qui Gon is like the most calm person during the, the all of the monsters they encounter during this core journey. I know, even even He's everyone like, is like fine. starting to panic. <laughs> Quagans just like no, it's I'll just fine. I'll just force push the sky, and then we'll <laughs> speed away. He doesn't give a shit. He plays fast and loose. With the life debt in hand, they Quagans uses that to use Jar Jar as a guide through the core. I'm not going to go into the whole sequence, but it is kind of cool to see them go through the core, and it's where the line like there's always a bigger fish because they get chased by a bigger a big fish and then there's a bigger fish after that and then an even bigger fish after that and it goes from like what's the dnd size is like large and gargantuan and then the one afterward almost kaiju yeah so that was that was this is the sequence where we also see qui-gon use a vulcan nerve pinch to knock jar jar unconscious (laughs) (laughs) callback (laughs) plays by his own rules it's like, Jar Jar, you need to shut up. And unconscious. <laughs> we cut back to Gunray, and he's talking to Sidious um, back on the droid control ship. Um, he tells, Sidious tells them that the Senate's just too bogged down with procedures, and they're d- basically, he's like, it's in the bag. We got this. You don't got to worry about anything else. Um, the Jedi aren't going to be able to do enough in time to stop what we're trying to do here. Viceroy Gunray goes all the way down to the ship after this. I think it cuts in between the the other the 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 bongo sequence. Yeah, um, the, the movie cuts back and forth so much. Like, there's so yeah. many parallel stories. Yeah, sorry, listeners. A lot of my notes, I I bulk some things together because it's just like the Jedi do this and then they do this and then they do that. Nothing happens. It's just like the progress of just them moving <laughs> to the next like important scene. So I have like two things that like. The gun rays, gun rays on the ship, and then all of a sudden he's on the planet. But yeah, that's that's basically how this plays out. So he's now on the planet. Um, the droid comes up and, he's, and he says, "The droid tells him like Viceroy, we've captured the queen." Um, and that's when he's like, "Ah, victory!" And that's when they go over. The Viceroy orders the droids to process the queen and uh, and her company into incarceration. And this is especially one of those shots where the green screen just kind of really stands out to me because you see like the, the Viceroy and um, what's his name? Rune Hako. I think his name is, they come down the the ramp and it just looks so horribly green screened. And then the immediate shot afterward is the characters are live on location in Italy or France or wherever, like the Naboo was shot. And because it's on location and it's real, it looks so much better even with all the CG creatures around them. Cause none of the battle droids were real. They were all CG and they blend in so much better compared to when it's the CG shots on the green screen. It just wasn't the tech wasn't quite there yet. The droids are pretty seamless, I'd say. I guess yeah. them not being animals or organic helps, but yeah, they, Jar Jar they look pretty, stands pretty out good. every now and then. 
And it depends on the lighting, especially, too. When they're in the swamp, I saw it a lot. I didn't see it that much on Tatooine because everything is just so brightly lit. Um, I guess maybe, like, subsurface scattering wasn't really honed in just yet. So um, in the less lit locations where that scattering would be more apparent, it stands out. But on Tatooine, where everything is so overexposed and it's so bright, you can't tell anyway, so it worked. Right. The queen at this point is wearing a black dress, and she is played by Kira Knightley, um, the same Elizabeth Swan from Pirates of the Caribbean. Decoy queen. She is the decoy queen, and she is the decoy queen for quite some time now. Yeah, it's a, it's a significant portion of the film. <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize. I to, thought it was like a to, quick bit. You start to forget, like, who is playing this character. Yep. Is she... Is Padme the queen the entire time up until the reveal? No. She is the queen. I was confused. When when we first see her and she's staring out the window and you see the wire going into her dress to light up the lights in her dress, that is is Natalie Portman. When she's wearing the iconic um, red dress with the weird, like, red headdress thing and the white face and the red, like, lipstick makeup thing, that's her. When she switches costumes to the black dress, that's when they do the switch, and it's no longer Natalie Portman, it's Kiera Knightley. And oh, is she it literally like, Kiera Knightley? Yes. Yeah. I thought they just... Okay, wow. Yeah, yeah they forever, swap a couple times. I forever just thought it was um, Natalie like, Portman, and it was just because she has makeup on, it's like, oh, she looks different enough. Yeah, well, I, you and Palpatine would be fooled. <laughs> <at> sh- <laughs> uh, today I learned... on Dean as well. <laughs> oh, I... Jesus. Wow, it you really can, looks like her. Yeah. I'm looking at it right now. I have the movie on the TV. Dean and Senate would be like, shoot them both. <laughs> I think there's like some TikTok interview where they asked one of them, and it's like, who oh, do you yeah, all was think Karen I was Knightley. taken for? And she's like, Natalie Portman. And it's just like, if you know, you know. It's kind of funny. Well, I guess they asked Natalie or uh, Kira Knightley, like, oh, are you going to come back for the new sequels? And a lot of people are getting like cameos and things. Are you going to reprise your role? And she's like, oh, as Padme? Like, no. And they're like, no, as the handmaiden, she's like, wait, I like I wasn't Padme, and they're like, no, and she's like, okay, then I'm probably not going to be asked to return to a role that I forgot what character I was. <laughs> I think her name is Sabe, but I could... yeah, which Sabe ends up coming back in a ton of, I guess, the the books and comics and things yeah. like that, which is kind of cool that it, like she becomes this like d- rebel force of. After Padme dies, she continues trying to hunt down her killer and, like, goes on the hunt for Vader. Yeah. And then once realizing it's Anakin, tries to pull Anakin back from the dark side. Then he kills her. Yeah, I don't think they ever, like, confirm her as dead, but the last interaction, I think, in the comics is he powers up and force pushes her off into, like, the water, and then just, she disappears. That happens a lot in the comics, that somebody tries to redeem Vader, and it it's... No. The Hang only on one yeah. second. Sorry, my gears keep turning. During the reveal, that's Natalie Portman saying, I'm the queen. In the swamp? At the end? Yeah. When she's like, This was a decoy, like I'm Well yeah, well the she's queen. not wearing she's not wearing anything. Yeah, wow. Well she's she's not naked. She's time. Holy crap, I forgot oh, no. it was that long. Well, no, she's they switch. They switch again when she, when they're in the Senate. That's that's oh, Natalie right, Portman. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. They swap back and forth, I think, like three but times throughout. I'm confused yeah. about Kira Knightley being a thing at all. And if yeah. the Queen I mentioned and Padme are Hollywood? identical. In my <laughs> notes, I mentioned like whenever there's a specific change and they swap, I mention who the Queen is at that point. But I if if Padme and the Queen are identical, Identical, unless I'm really confused about something. Why do they need Kira Knightley? They're not identical. It's just they look similar enough with the makeup and face paint that people don't realize that it's the wrong person. It's just the thing that it's just it's just canon. Um, it's something that the Naboo does for protection, and they'll often swap the queen out with a decoy. Just I get in case. That. Here's my confusion: Padme and Amidala are different people. Pad no pad pad what? They're not. They're they're not. They're they're the same person. Padme Amadala is one person. Oh Jesus Christ! I didn't know that was her name. <laughs> That's her last name. 
<laughs> okay, no, that, that that clears up all confusion. Wait, I'm what, back to on. square now one. I got, now I got to look at something here because <laughs> Naberi is what? Oh, maybe it's like a Spanish thing where Amidala Naberi is like how Hispanics have, they take like the father and the mother's last name. I'm not going to look into it. Reader, listener, this is this is your <laughs> this job. Is, this to... is in the weeds, the deep weeds. I thought Padme and Amidala were different people. That's why I was really confused. Why you need a third person to be the decoy. <laughs> no, so, uh, listeners, yeah, I'm, it's, I'm uh, shoot, shoot it, hit us up in the comments with my correction on that and tell me the difference <laughs> between Padme and Amidala and Padme and Amidala and Naberi. It's in my head somewhere, but I mean, there's a lot of other Star Wars stuff that I've had to make room, so my head is often like that thing in Dreamcatcher where there's like a file room system, and I gotta burn stuff to make room for other things. <laughs> Over the course of my age, just you know that that file room is getting kind of smaller, but it still it still has a lot of stuff in it. So anyway, the Jedi already in Theed. Um, fun fact: when they arrive in Theed and they kind of surface up. And then Qui-Gon gets up and then he starts looking around and just as he looks behind him, it cuts. That's actually a deleted scene where they um, surfaced right in front of a waterfall and hijinks ensued as they tried to get off of the ship in time before they fell over the waterfall. And that is um, shot cut. And I think most of the special effects are done. They just cut it out for pacing and timing. So if you YouTube that, you can see that, which is a cool little extra bit. Uh Aha. But um, the Jedi are already in Theed. They find the Queen's escort and they take out the guards. And I love how Qui-Gon Jinn's style of lazy lightsaber deflection. Meanwhile, <laughs> Ewan is like just 200 percenting every single move that he does. And it's like that perfect example of a guy that's been at his job for 20 years versus the new guy who's just trying to be seen. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Qui-Gon just realized years ago that he gets paid the same amount. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I, my my performance of vows come back. Yoda's like, you're doing such a good job. <laughs> it's like, but, but so am I going to get a new rank? And, you know, it's like, well, we promote you to the rank of master, but we aren't giving you a pay raise. <laughs> yeah, it's like, Qui-Gon's like, does that come with a raise? It's like, no. He's like, okay, no, yeah, that's fine then. Yeah, it's good. Uh, I'm not going to work on this anymore. <laughs> They get a they get a stipend and it doesn't change. It's all based on metachlorians anyway these days. That's why he's out there betting starships and uh, illegal pod races and just <laughs> and just met Jedi mind tricking anybody for any reason. <laughs> um, the Jedi introduce themselves to the Queen, who is here nightly at this point, and you clearly see Natalie Portman behind her. There are they have like a secret communication so that the Queen never speaks out against what the queen says so when he but this was clever and i don't know if it's written in the movie or if this was decided after the fact but the way that the exchange happens where qui-gon is telling them like look we need to get the fuck out of here and go to, to coruscant to plead your case and the queen says i'm not willing to do that she looks to padme the handmaiden or one of the handmaidens and she says whatever she says you know we're willing to fight with you you know, and we're willing to be brave, whatever, basically telling her like, yeah, let's do this. And that's when she decides, all right, let's go. It wasn't until that point in time where she had the queen's permission to go ahead with that because she's not the queen. She can't say yes when the queen's going to be like, hold up, you know, pump the brakes just because you're dressed in the uniform. Doesn't mean you get to uh, (laughs) drive the car kind of thing. So she agrees. Um, and then for all the faults that this movie has, it does have some shining scenes like this one. Um, anytime the droids are fighting against a Jedi, it's awesome to see Ewan, you know, put everything into his performance. And even the whole gag of like, halt, where are you taking them? Coruscant? That doesn't compute. Oh, wait, uh, you're under arrest. That always makes me laugh because it just harkens back to, you know, Han's whole bit with like on the Death Star. It's like, you know, situation, OK, you know, everything's normal. You know, we had a reactor malfunction. Everything's all right here. We're fine. We're all fine here now. Thank you. I, I love that, you? that. I do love that part with the battle drone. It's like you can see the if then statements in his code, like breaking <laughs> down. <laughs> it's so, like if if then else. And then he's just like running it. And it's like, um, uh, 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 uh. and then it just defaults to like a, a, a caught in the you, loop. You're under arrest. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Uh, so they escape from the planet and then they race through the blockade. Never understood why in Star Wars, like how these kind of blockades actually work. And just go up. 
Why, why ships just also fly in a straight line? <laughs> you could have just gone the opposite the side of the planet. Like, like I love how in like the original Star Wars, Han's like, "Don't worry, kid. I know some maneuvers. We'll get. We'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll outmaneuver them." And he just lists lazily to the left. <laughs> the family Guy does the whole skit on that. I mean, it, yeah. but it's true. They just go sh- like, "What are you doing? You move. You're getting blasted." going straight at this thing that's shooting like a thousand lasers at you at once but whatever it's like you can go any direction we don't know how big the planet is but you think of the vastness of space and like how they can't be everywhere it's like yeah yeah it's, go, over, go over that way i mean the only other thing would be is if um the blockade does surround the entire planet it's just our focal length we don't see others but who knows i don't i don't know so during their escape, the ship takes massive damage um, from the shields failing to the hyperdrive being disabled. Uh, one blue astromech was able to fix the shields, uh, but because of the damage um, to the hyperdrive specifically, they're not able to jump to light speed, so they can't really go to Coruscant as they were expecting. So they're going to have to land on a nearby planet, which happens to be Tatooine, to either fix or replace that hyperdrive. Always the goddamn hyperdrive. Always. Which, I mean, when they're going up and trying to fix the the repairs and whatnot, and those droids are just getting blasted off into space, um, and then they're like, the hyperdrive is leaking. Hopefully the hyperdrive isn't like a nuclear core kind of thing of like, you might have some lasting long-term health effects on down the line from flying on a leaking hyperdrive for a while. Oh yeah, there's so Whereas- many different things that we don't know how anything works in Star Wars, and it's also joked that no one in Star Wars knows how anything works, and that's why the technology really hasn't advanced in 2,000 years. It was, like, gifted to them by an alien race, and they're just like, oh. The hyperdrive is leaking. Leaking what, exactly? I don't know. It's just stuff's coming out of it. I think it's bad. I believe it was leaking coolant. Oh. So it's it's just a second engine. So if they were to go into hyperspace, it would blow up, and they didn't. That would be bad. I guess that'd be bad. They should just take the Warhammer 40k route and be like, we invented all of this technology. And then we got really sketchy around people who invent things and we murdered them all because we thought they were religious heretics. So now we don't have any new technology. <laughs> well, that's just backing yourself up in the corner. <laughs> They're just like, it's like, oh, the, 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 uh, the engineers, they built all of this cool stuff and then they didn't believe in the God that we did. So we murdered them all. Now we have no <laughs> new technology. And when we discover new technology, it's blasphemy. It's like, oh, this is a weird approach. I think I just made a crazy connection in my head and I have to check up on it. What's that? Yes, Dean, they were a decoy queen. <laughs> <laughs> so Wait, super- why do you need Kira Knightley? <laughs> So no, you didn't tell I, me that she wasn't there the whole time. Here's here's my prediction. The, there's a guy flying this. Sh- whose ship is this that they're escaping on? It's, uh, it's the hers. Queens. The yeah. guy is flying it. You get several shots of him. Yes. I'm like, he looks so fucking familiar. Rick McCollum? No, that's not his. Um, and I'm oh, what, pretty sure it's yeah. Captain Panaka, right? That's flying it. No, no, no. no he's he's the head. He's of like a. He's kind of looks like Robert England a little bit, kind of, but not really. Rick Olay. Oh, that's, that's right. Right, right, right. That's his name. His name is Rick Olay. I'm I'm 99% sure he plays in Wayne's World 2. He's like the head, like the legendary roadie that they recruit. That's all. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's the same guy. I'm checking on, up I on can, it right I can, now. I can tell you. Dean sitting there like, being, just racking his so brain familiar. on this factoid. <laughs> Dean Somehow. is just full on sprinting through his mind <laughs> palace, pulling pamphlets out of everywhere. He is played by Ralph Brown. Yeah, that's him, Del and, Preston. Yep. yep. <laughs> he was also an Alien fun, 3. Fun fact. I was like, this guy, he just looks so familiar. He Damn. also it was in Red Dead Redemption 2. Oh. Huh. Good for him. He played the local pedestrian population. I was going to say, he played the horse. <laughs> 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 he made the clip-clop sounds. The astromech droids are activated to repair the ship's exterior, and during their escape, they took the massive damage. Um, shield failing, one blue astromech. Uh, back with the Viceroy, um, he's speaking with Sidious, and he's kind of like the puppet master to all of this, and he informs him that the Queen has escaped, 
And that's where Sidious is like, you know what? I'm going to bring in my apprentice, Darth Maul, to find the queen <laughs> which, and her lost ship. Which I love how you have the hologram <laughs> of him there. And then he's like, I will bring in my apprentice. And then Darth Maul just pops up on the hologram over his shoulder. He's like, have you just been waiting just <laughs> off webcam view until he said that? So you can walk in, not do anything. And it was just like, okay, and you saw him. Hmm. Hologram out. And it just <laughs> shuts off. Especially everybody's like, Sidious, who is that behind you? He's like, <laughs> step away. Every Get time. Back. 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 What, if, what if they're like, Sidious, who's that behind you? What? <laughs> <Turns past. laughs> just That's like, not my apprentice. The, the Sith, they, they just have a flair for the dramatic. I mean, we, we see Darth Vader do it all the time. Like in um, Rebel One, when he turns off his, his Night Bright chest plate so that he <laughs> the can... Jedi don't believe in emotion. The Sith only believe in pizzazz. <laughs> <laughs> so he could surprise them on the, on the Corvette and <laughs> like, he like held his breath and turned off his lights so he could surprise them. <laughs> Which I still think would have been so much more scary if all of a sudden when all of that turned back on, he can breathe again and he just lets out like a <gasps> <gasps> just gasps. <laughs> oh my god. He's killing rebel troops, but he's having like an asthma attack. He force chokes a guy and then like does his inhaler and then hits another guy. He's just doing that classic like talking like you just ran up three flights of stairs and you don't want the people <laughs> to know that you're winded, <laughs> but you have to like talk to them right afterwards. Uh, back on the ship, R2-D2 is introduced here and Kara Knightley tells the real queen in disguise to clean the droid, which I think is funny. And while she's cleaning R2, um, um, I, I abbreviated everyone's name. So uh, when I say JJ catches Padme up on how he wound up there, I'm thinking in my head that it's JJ Abrams, but I mean Jar Jar. So Cat That's Jar Jar catches up with Padme on how he wound up there. Um, yeah. So then next, um, the shiny chrome ship lands in the middle of the bright ass desert on Tatooine outside of one of the cities named Mos Espa. It's probably like almost stealth since it's so chrome. Like, yeah, probably just hard to see in general. Yeah, blind by the reflection. <laughs> that the camouflage is you just don't want to look at it. And you're like, oh, is there a third sun on Tatooine? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Qui Gon, Jar Jar, and R2 head out to Mos Espa, and Mos Espa, and Padme is ordered by the Queen to join them. So in hindsight, knowing this, um, first time viewers would just see that the handmaiden is there with them. But now knowing the queen wanted to tag along and she's pretty adventurous and she wants to uh, kind of do this herself kind of thing. And she wants to know what's happening. So they make their way into the city and Qui-Gon finds a local junk dealer named Watto and his shop assistant slave, Anakin. Uh, Watto happens to have the exact parts that Qui-Gon needs, but Qui-Gon doesn't happen to have the right currency to purchase what's needed. Um, fun fact, while they walk through the junkyard, which Easter egg, um, the escape pod from 2001 A Space Odyssey is actually seen here in the uh, junkyard. Um, is Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan not carrying universal currency on their belt at all times? Well, it, their, their money is good. It's just they are so far from where. Well, it's... I was talking about their lightsabers. Well, they're they're not. They're not like the the type in D and D to be like the the hobo murderers and the. Well, clearly <laughs> not, because even at one point, like Qui Gon is just like, "Wow, they have a lot of slaves here," but not really my problem anyway. <laughs> they kind of just brush over all of that. He's like, "I'm not here to free slaves." Well, there's I'm a. I'm just lot... here to get my hyperdrive. There's a the problem with slavery, um, at least in this world anyway, is not so much that it's not like Harriet Tubman can go up and set up an underground railroad on Tatooine and just get him out of there. No, every be a space railroad. <laughs> every every Which slave would be so cool <laughs> has a, an explosive device embedded inside them so that if they try to run, the slave owner can just hit a switch and they the slave will literally blow up. Oh, so this is more like the beginning of the running man. Yeah. So it's not like he came here to free slaves because he didn't want to. It's just he has to convince the the slave owner to one, release them and two, find out where the device is that would make them explode. Because I, if I not, mean, 
The, the simple answer is he's a Jedi, which is essentially a cop, and he just wants to keep the status quo. He doesn't yeah. Know, he, Keep things the yeah, way they are. I, I have a long, long problem with the Jedi Order in these movies of like, <laughs> oh, so you guys don't actually want to do good. You just want to do the same. Yeah. He I even mean, says, too, like, slavery is outlawed, but they're just so far from the galactic center that it's, they can't enforce it. So. I yeah. do think, though, that, like, Qui-Gon was moments time. away from just, like, threatening Watto with his lightsaber. Like, he already did the Jedi mind trick. Like, you, you were literally going to use space magic to make this person do whatever you wanted. You're not that far away from just threatening them. Just yeah, I was really hollow. surprised when to he's like, Toydarians aren't affected by Jedi mind tricks. It just, like, undoes his saber. Or he, he just, like, starts to... Very gingerly force pull a tower of junk closer and closer to Watto. <laughs> <laughs> or if he just grabs him by the neck and just starts punching him. <laughs> there could be a very easily be an accident where a bunch of wreckage just falls on you. It's a slippery slope. <laughs> Master, how did you get the hyperdrive? I thought we were broke. I have a particular set of skills. <laughs> I mean, he just went there at night and then he used the force to levitate it out of the junkyard. <laughs> I mean, honestly, that's a very like Luke, like later in life, Luke Skywalker thing to do. <laughs> so Watto, Watto tells him no. Um, they're forced nah. to now find another option and the whole gang leaves Watto's shop. Um, meanwhile, while they were taking the stroll through the junkyard just before they leave, Anakin does meet Padme, and he thinks of her as, like, an angel as seen on one of the moons of Viago. Whatever that means, but the kid is smitten <laughs> over this teenage girl that just walked in. I mean, when I, when I just recently saw it again, I, like, I, I get what they were trying to do with the script, where they were doing the whole, like, you know, sailors used to think they saw mermaids, and yeah. he was doing that, but for space. But, like, oh, man. He's trying. Not a great line that they wrote. I will say that realizing that it's, I, I figured it was actually the queen there, and she's like, the, Qui-Gon's always like, the queen, trust me, so like, do what I want. That, me that means a lot more now. <laughs> Classic Qui-Gon. 100% the queen. I was going to bring order, this up. The ordering around. I was going to bring this up later during the reveal, but I think Qui-Gon knows this is the queen. From the well, start. When she finally reveals herself, he just has like a yeah, that smile and a nod. Like yep. he looks at he looks at Kenobi like you owe me five bucks. You know, like it's <laughs> like they had that secret bet that wasn't said on screen. But he just like, like I'm telling you, Obi Wan, Padme is the queen, or you know, like that that handmaiden is the queen, and he's just like, no, no, you can't be that. She, the queen was here the whole time. You know, she's got the the thing on and. You know, she's being all queen like. That's that. No, the, I have the queen with me the whole time. And like, no, I'm telling you. And then when the whole reveal happens, he just looks at him like, "Yep, told you." She's got the thing. She's being a queen. Obi Wan's like, "Isn't the queen Kira Knightley?" <laughs> so I, I think he knew the whole time, and that's why, um, whenever Padme kind of argued against his judgment, and he's just like, "The queen trusts me." And you know, yeah, I'm gonna that makes do, a lot more. It, it's that's like such a, that's such a bitch move. It's like, what are you gonna say? What are yeah. you gonna say? The queen trusts me. Is she gonna say different? I approve this method. So it's like he's forcing her to either come out of the, her quote unquote hiding or just just let me do what I'm doing and I, I got this. Yeah. Well, because there's that moment where he's like, the queen trusts my judgment. And I, I, I can't remember how she phrased it. She's like, yeah, but I disagree. It's like, well, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Who disagrees? Who? Uh, who? Who is it? So the gang, now that they've officially left, um, they are walking through the marketplace, and then Jar Jar gets into a scuffle and gains the unwanted attention from Sebulba. 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 He's one of the local pod racers, and he's kind of like a gangster kind of... No, he's just he's a gruff guy, and he's not willing... He's not afraid to start a fight with somebody over... He plays as, dirty. Yeah, he, something stupid like this. So Anakin um, comes in, he saves Jar Jar from Sebulba through some light intimidation. And I can see like the dice rolls happening behind the scenes if this were a video game. It's like, hey, he's a big time outlander. I don't think you want to fuck with him. And it's just like, you know, roll success. 
<laughs> and it makes Sebulba back down. Bardic inspiration. Yeah. The, this is the big scene where, like, this is where I really noticed the acting swing go for Jake Lloyd. Because when he's talking Hatties and talking to Sebulba specifically, and it has the captions, his acting's perfect. Like, you, I fully believe this kid is speaking a mm. foreign language. Oh, yeah. The, the line delivery is so much better. Yeah. And then when he switches back to talking to uh, Qui Gon Jin after the whole thing, it's just like, what's his line? Like, a, a very bad d- dog named Sebulba. And just the way that he says this, like, yep, good job. You literally read that from a page. It is so clear on that. So um, a sandstorm begins to kick up, and, and Anakin invites Qui Gon and party to his home for safety here they meet his mother who is also a slave and um, Anakin shows Padme the droid he's building and we see that Anakin is making C-3PO the legendary duo meet for the first time where R2 tells 3PO that he's naked and his parts are showing this is a kids movie so we gotta get a laugh somehow (laughs) (laughs) I like the, 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 the concept that droids can be naked it's like an interesting, like, why, why do they know what oh, yeah. that why, is? Why do they, like, yeah, and why do they have shame about it? Yeah, yeah why, why were they programmed with modesty? <laughs> like, also, it's, I thought of it as not he's missing his clothes. I thought it was he's only skin and muscle. He's, like, missing his outer layer. Mm-hmm. I thought this was, like, a Hellraiser Frank situation, not, like, Oh, you just don't have your shirt and pants. I, was, I took it as like when you take a dog's collar off and you're like, you're naked. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> that just a me thing? <laughs> yeah, just you. <laughs> no, David no. also doesn't have a dog, so he's just like sitting there. His wife's just, what? What, what are you doing? Nobody thinks take that you take a dog's collar off that the dog's naked now? What? And you're naked. I saw like some stupid TikTok where it's like your dog's at the vet and the vet comes in and the person's like oh, and they hide covering the dog and it's censored because the, the the collar's in the person's hand <laughs> it made me laugh i get it david i i am on the same page. i'm picking up what you're putting down so as the sandstorm rages on obi-wan on the ship receives a transmission from naboo the quote-unquote queen sees this and um the transmissions from what's his name I'm trying to remember from Bilbo. memory co bibble that's it his name is co bibble um that their people are being massacred and they need to hurry up and, you know, please contact us. Um, he re- Obi-Wan relays this message. It just tells him he doesn't actually send the message to him. To Qui-Gon and Qui-Gon's like, no, this is a trap. And then literally two seconds later, um, we hop over to Coruscant where we see Sidious is meeting with Darth Maul. And we confirm that that transmission was a trap. And um, that transmission's trap hasn't been sprung yet. They sent out that message but they haven't responded to it so they're still waiting for them to uh do that so Sidious just orders Maul to search them out um fun fact behind the scenes um Coruscant was originally created by Timothy Zahn and um it was a book only planet leading up to this point in time and George made this a canon officially during the Return of the Jedi special edition and this is the first time we truly see it in all of its glory in The Phantom Menace. Huh. It is a cool reveal, like the whole Coruscant thing. Like, we had never seen anything like that in Star Wars yet. And it's just like, oh, well Yeah. Then. And especially during that time where um, you had book canon and then you had, like, the movies. But the movies always take precedent. So whatever happens in the books, and that was always a big contention, too, when Disney bought Star Wars. Like, what's going to happen to the old canon? Like, what's going to happen? And a lot of that stuff was lost because they just left it to the curb and they adopted a lot of things, but um, some things still haven't been brought back to canon that I unfortunately miss. But of course, I'm thankful God for damn at least Skywalker this. children. Yeah. You know, the so thing, much better. The, the thing that kills me the most, not to digress, but the only planet I wish they fully made canon was Korriban. They decided mm. to rename it to a Moraband instead, but they also said, like, yeah, sometimes it's called Koraband, but we're going to call it Moraband from now on. It's the same exact planet, just they renamed it to something else, and I, it kills me that they go as far as to change names, especially for just, like, it's a nitpicking thing. Like, why are you changing the name? I understand yeah, why I they changed like- Jizz to, I think, Jats. <laughs> 
I understand I why I they did see that, that one. Too. When did that happen? I I didn't think they changed the name of that. It was like a J.K. Rowling <laughs> tweet out of nowhere. It's like, hey, by the way, you want to know more about Jats? It's like, well, wait a minute. You changed Jizz? Jizz is the theme or is the is the genre of music that the Cantina song is that is technically a Jizz song. <laughs> <laughs> and they named it from Jizz Sorry. to Jats. And it's just like a complete spur of the moment out of the blue thing where they made that announcement. And people so are like, I, I what the, I what forgot, the hell? I forgot that that's what that was called. But also... You let that hang way too long before explaining yourself. In a smoky room, the drinks like flowed as Obi-Wan entered a cantina filled with jizz. <laughs> and then the best part, a... Uh, jats, please jats. A jizz musician is called a jizz whaler. <laughs> I don't see why they changed any of this. Check Wikipedia, I am not lying. Yeah, that's a, yeah. Now I have to find out how old the word jizz was in reference to that. <laughs> I think George Lucas was just a bad writer, and he's just like, I don't want to call it jazz. He's a <laughs> Or what if it's been around for a long time, and then George Lucas finally looked it up, and he's like, oh my god. No, nah, he's, a, he's a horny guy. He knew what he was doing. <laughs> hey, what's uh, George, what's the name of this? Uh, I'm going to call it jizz. Uh, well, this is going to be an uh, uh, incognito search. <laughs> Do it on your the work earliest, computer. The earliest known use of jizz is the 1920s. I was gonna say I I, lo I love looking up this kind of thing. Uh, this is a side tangent, but kind of related. Uh, I've been watching the the show Shogun recently. It's a great period piece Japanese show. Um, and a an English character in the show says like "fuck" all the time, like all the time. And this is supposed to be like 13th century. And I'm just like, was this word around? So I'm like sitting on the couch watching this episode, being like, when was the word "fuck" invented? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, this is a weird search, but all right. In 1200 BC, when a man stubbed his toe for the first time in the night. I mean, honestly, it actually it actually ended up making sense because apparently the word is crazy old. Huh. It's, it's German, isn't it? Uh, I remember a meme thing coming remember. out, like explaining it, but I don't, I don't know, I don't remember. I'm trying to remember what it said, but I think that, I think it made reference to like old Scottish version of it. The more you know. Or Gaelic, I guess I should say. So Anakin and his mom served dinner to their new guests. The sandstorm is still, you know, raging, so. Um, uh, they're explaining to them, like, this is how, like, slaves work. And um, when it comes to just, like, you know, if you get too far, they'll blow you up. Boom. And then, like, that's they, they have remote-controlled explosives in their body. Um, this is a kid's movie, by the way. The topic of pod racing comes up. Anakin beams on how like no other human can do it, but he can. You know, Qui Gon brings up that you know you need Jedi reflexes to do this, and Anakin claims to know that Qui Gon's a Jedi because of his laser sword. But then Qui Gon's like, well, he decides to be coy, and he just he suggests to him like, well, maybe I killed a Jedi and took it from him. And then Anakin replies back saying, no one can kill a Jedi. And this is where the title card from <laughs> Always Sunny in Philadelphia comes in. And Anakin kills all the Jedi. So evidently in 1842, the word jism originated, <laughs> meaning, meaning energy, um, and would later in 1888 become synonymous semen. with semen. So, so I guess uh, that's it where it came from. Energy. Um, it was <laughs> out for at least 90 years before George wrote this, so unless it just wasn't in the popular lexicon until then. He knew what he was doing. Tim, I love how your voice like goes so low in like, radio announcer when you're discussing things like that. It's telling you're playing soft hits from the 1980s. <laughs> I got um, a new jizz wailing bop coming right at you. That soft, soft jizz. <laughs> <laughs> we are all 12. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Qui-Gon realizes there's no fooling Anakin and uh, reveals to him and his mother why they're actually there. The ship's broken and all that. Um, Anakin realizes that his, this is his chance to help and even get to pod race. And um, they decide to use the local greed to their advantage and set a bet against Watto. I, I, loved, I loved this little bit in hindsight where Shmi is like, oh, like... I don't know, you've got to, you know, the pod racing, it's it's their weakness. Isn't Shmi the one who got them sold into slavery by betting on a pod race? 
Oops. Well, she's learned from her mistake. <laughs> or she's... it's just a gambling addiction. <laughs> well, also at some point, somebody tells Shmi, like, I'm sure Qui-Gon doesn't want to put your son in danger. And then proceeds to just put Anakin in danger for the rest of this film. <laughs> well, it's like that thing with Bob from Bob's Burgers. Like, fine, all right, but I'm going to complain about it the whole time. Because she... <laughs> She was not on board with this and like, all right, fine. But she was very much against it at every step of the way. Also, I don't know if it's in your notes, so I don't want to jump ahead if you're going to discuss this because it's the next scene of Qui-Gon explains to Shmi that Anakin is a Jedi and Shmi sends that Anakin was immaculately conceived. Wait, you said you didn't want to jump ahead and then you proceeded to jump ahead. Well, no, if that's in his notes, then cut oh, that. Oh, okay. Yeah, got you. I see. The, Sorry. It's, they have the discussion on Anakin plans to use their racer in the pot race, and then that's the next discussion with Qui-Gon and Shmi. Got you. I don't like that her name is Shmi. Shmi. <laughs> Shmi. See? Get me the pan, Shmi. <laughs> the boo-boo box. <laughs> <laughs> the juice box. Watto's putting us in the boo-boo box, Qui-Gon. We need your help. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can only get one of you out of the boo-boo box. <laughs> So the next day they go to Watto and um, they, they set up the bet um, for the whole pod race. So Watto's going to pay the entry fee. And um, if Qui-Gon wins, Watto gets to keep the winnings minus the cost of the parts for his ship, which he still gets the full winning cost. Um, while if Watto wins, he, get, he gets to keep Qui-Gon's ship. That's pretty big. Um, Watto agrees to this and Anakin gets to work on this. They, get, they, they go back to his place to... Uh, work on the pod and then i like i like how they slap on the deal and they don't shake they just yeah just, just like I, you low also i like them. how qui-gon really doesn't push the point of like and uh if i win i get two of your slaves anakin <laughs> and his mother no you only get one okay well fair enough <laughs> she would have made things she would have made things complicated anyway here we go <laughs> yeah so your kid's like basically gonna go and um swear a life of celibacy and He's not allowed to know you anymore, so we can shack him up in the Jedi consulate place, but you're you're on your own. We're just going to leave you. We're going to use a, a Jedi Force procedure that just will make you forget all about your son. Sounds like a Qui-Gon thing to do. I'm going to force push your brain out of your head. <laughs> hey Yoda, this kid just fell on my lap. I don't know where his parents are. Shmi, get down. <laughs> Back at Anakin's place, Qui-Gon asks his mother about Anakin's special gifts and who the father was. She tells him of basically being immac it's basically immaculate conception. There's no father. The old canon, this was in a comic, and I this kind of like went back and forth. Originally, Darth Plagueis was the one to have done it. Uh, in, in episode three, I didn't I realized this whole thing after I um wrote all this out. So um this is all me going by memory. I'm also trying to trigger Star Wars fans to get in the comments. So please um correct me. Get in the comments. Get in the comments. I'm already in them. <laughs> so, um, in the canon that no longer is, Darth Plagueis was the one that created um, Anakin. He created, in episode three, Palpatine tells Anakin that his master had the ability to influence the Force and create life. He's talking about Anakin. He was the one that was uh, able to figure out the Force and create Anakin from that far away. And then that was changed to something more similar to basically uh, Palpatine doing all of that and creating a virgins in the force. And it's insinuated that it's actually Palpatine is Anakin's father, but I don't fully remember anymore on what canon basically says now, only because it's all mixed between books and comics and there's some conflicts between the two. So please get in the comments, correct me. But um, long story short, I, I like to believe the headcanon that it was Palpatine that actually created Anakin. And it just happened to land with Shmi's womb, specifically. She wasn't targeted for any reason. Just she happened to be the one out of like 10, 30, 50 billion, 100 billion people. She was the one to actually conceive. So Wait, so how did Shmi get pregnant? Yeah, I was, I'm just, I was I'm kind just of, kidding. I'm, I'm just kidding. I was getting confused a little bit. I get confused. <laughs> It just well, all the midichlorians decided that Shmi was going to have a baby. The, the, the kid was made, but just kind of like, it's like artificial insemination, but just sent out into the air. So as of March 18th this year, how 
was Anakin created? George Lucas has three theories. Let's see. Three theories? He wrote it. <laughs> it's not like it actually happened and he was like thinking about it. It's a Screen Rant article, so half these things are clickbait anyway. The, the third but... one will surprise you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lucas believes Star Wars should never explain Anakin's origins to maintain the mystery and respect its vision. Yeah, I get that. Um, Chosen One <laughs> Prophecy. I, fuck, I never actually looked into the notes on what the fuck that is because I still think it's stupid. Anakin's mysterious creation has three theories. Sith manipulation, midi-chlorians, or the Force itself. The Sith, a Sith manipulated the midi-chlorians to create Anakin. Um, first theory suggests that uh, Lucas brought up when discussing how Anakin was born, suggests that a super Sith manipulated the midi-chlorians to create the Chosen One. It's important to point out that during the specific answer, Lucas does not enclose who that super Sith might be, although the most logical options are either Palpatine or Darth Plagueis. I just, I just like the word super Sith. <laughs> Super Sith. Super Sith. Oh, XR Coon. <laughs> he is the Super Sith. Yeah, that, that still doesn't make any sense. There's a really good article that I read on it that I just don't remember. Where it's just where it's just like you like you can use the force to make someone pregnant. Let me see here. Um on Wikipedia. And like I, I also don't I don't agree with George Lucas's idea that the birth of Anakin has to be a mystery. Like we know everything about him except how he was born. Like that's that's not a big detail. You could be like, "Oh yeah, he had a dad, he died." Cool. I'm going right. to assume he yeah, I'm going to assume he probably felt like that yeah, that should be grander if it was a person who has their own thing and he didn't want to Oh, into it. like then people would be like, "Oh, I want to learn more about the father." Yeah, I assume he's just like, "I don't want to like get into write more lineage. That. Let's just cut him off here." Well, it's it's like George Lucas's interview when he he talked about what his vision for the sequels was, and he wanted to do like a microcosm movie that like investigates the world of the Metaclorians and their like microbacteria world. So it, this <laughs> is shit. it is legends. Or and that's what in Star Wars we call the stuff that used to be canon until Disney bought it. It is legends that Darth Plagueis conducted what is called the Grand Experiment, and he used Sith alchemy in the dark side of the Force with the intention to create the living embodiment of the Force. He tried to influence the midi chlorians in an order in an attempt to create life, and then he it didn't work, and he deemed it a failure. And then flash mm. forward um, 10 years, he realizes, oh, it did work. But Palpatine was the one that discovered this, not Darth Plagueis. Aha! I mean, I guess it also just serves to be like, why did Qui-Gon really want to train this boy? He's like, I think he's the prophecy, which says that the Sith will be killed by someone with no father. Well, the chosen one. He believes yeah. that it, yeah, it's the chosen the one. Yeah, from the prophecy. Tim, did you look that up? Because I actually didn't. Looked up what? The Chosen One prophecy? Uh, No, all I know is that there was the Chosen One from the prophecy that's supposed to bring balance to the Force. That was the extent I know. And supposedly it was supposed to be like immaculately conceived or something. Yeah, he says like no father, like does not have a father. So I think that's why he was like... So I I looked it up and the original Legends explanation is um, Plagueis was the one that um, influenced life and midi he influenced the midi chlorians to create life his experiment he thought failed and then 10 years later palpatine discovers the kid is born without a father through immaculate conception and palpatine puts two and two together and realizes that that experiment succeeded and i'm going to take that virgins in the force as my apprentice but i'm not going to tell plagueis about it plagueis is still alive during this point in time in the story Wait, so Plagueis is around, we just don't see Plagueis in this? Yes. Have we gotten Plagueis in any of the, no. like, film and show media? None. Huh. Which one is Darth Tyrannus? That is uh, Count Dooku. That is Christopher Lee. Oh, okay. I don't know why all of them get cool handles and the Jedi are just the Jedi. It's just, like, your name. Or maybe it's not. Maybe you do get, you get a different kind of name. I'm not really sure. Yeah, because it was to say, like, isn't Palpatine... Darth, uh, was it Sidious? Mm. But his name's not like Sidious Palpatine. No, it's really 
tame camera. I'm trying to remember what his yeah, first name. Yeah, Chief. So that evening, while Qui Gon is cleaning up Anakin's cuts and bruises from working on the pod racer, which is now up and running and working, he draws Anakin's blood and has Obi Wan do a midi chlorian count. So Obi Wan, <laughs> as one does, um, Obi Wan confirms that the uh, the kids is it's over nine thousand and it's actually over twenty thousand. And it's where a number that not even Master Yoda has that much. So a book named Star Wars Graphics published in 2016, which is two years after the Legends cut off in 2014, Anakin has 27,700 midichlorians in his body at the time of um, when he becomes Darth Vader and everything before that. Once he gets like... Once he's put in the suit, the number's much less. I just don't have that number handy. Um, the next person up is Palpatine at 20,500. Yoda has 17,700. Luke has 14,500. And then it drops down substantially to Qui-Gon at 10,000. Chewbacca has 7,200. Padme has 4,700. And then... Regular schmucks like Boba Fett, Han Solo, and Owen Lars, they have 1,500. So that's the scale of what you can kind of see on uh, Force sensitivity and whatnot. Chewbacca having that high of a number, he almost could have been a Jedi. Been a Jedi? <laughs> almost. <laughs> that would be cool. If Han wasn't holding him back. There's other people mentioned in this graph too, um, but I picked out the most... Um, iconic names like Count Dooku has 13,500 um, Baru Lars Shmi Lando they have 3,300 um, General Grievous has 11,900 Mace Windu has 12,000 wait a minute where are the midichlorians and Grievous it's all in his heart so that means Anakin was stronger before he became Vader yes well I mean he was huh. He was Darth Vader as a human for, like, all of, like, you know, three hours. Yeah. But um, once he put on the suit, yeah, he lost a lot. Which is so funny, because, like, as Darth Vader, he was still incredibly powerful. I wonder if it's just, like, raw power versus technique. Just imagine how much more powerful he would be if he still had all his limbs. Limbs. I mean, that's true. Like, Anakin Skywalker in the Clone Wars was, like, Superman, basically. What if it wasn't going into the suit that lowered his midichlorians? It's the fact that he lost two limbs. So, like, his leg probably had 2,000. His arm probably had 2,000. I, I do just I, I do just want to go on record being like, midichlorians are dumb. <laughs> they are. Yeah. They're real um, dumb. <laughs> like, they're not I, nearly I, 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 as, like, prevalent as it used to be, but um, the Bad Batch currently is doing a thing with midichlorians, and that's just kind of doing a like a layup to explain the Grogu thing and all mm -hmm. the cloning and then how Palpatine eventually comes back in Rise of Skywalker. They're slowly kind of leading up to that to fill in a lot of the gaps. So right now they don't even call it midi chlorians, they just call it an M count. Mm. It's just it's just really lazy writing where they just needed to very quickly explain why Anakin was so strong. Or um, Lucas was a huge Dragon Ball Z fan, and this was just his way of making power levels. I mean, it, it is just DBZ power levels. Wait, actually, was Dragon Ball out by the okay. time that the first Star Wars? Well, yeah, of course it was. Although, although, when did they introduce power levels in Dragon Ball? I mean, Dragon Ball was like 15 years old by that point in time. So Yeah, well, no, I think they introduced power levels in Dragon Ball Z because it's the first time they use scouters. Ah, so Dragon Ball originated as a manga in 1984. Meanwhile, Darth Maul um, arrives on the planet. I love the sound design for the ship and just the whole movie in general. But um, you see his ship fly by the camera. It lands. Um, and then he scans the landscape with his binoculars, and then he calls out probe droids to go out and search for the missing Jedi and the Queen. He has good reason to believe that they're here. So the next day is the big race. They all meet um, the Jedi and the gang, not Darth Maul. Uh, they all meet at the Mos Espa <laughs> Arena, and um, they're in the garage. What is where pod racing? All the pods are being serviced <laughs> before the race. 
Uh, Qui-Gon adds to the pot um, with Watto, throwing in Anakin's pod for both Anakin and his mother's freedom. Watto's like, fuck no. Uh, that's not, they're not worth two slaves. It's not worth one pod, not by a long shot. And then with some subtle wave of the force, a dice roll to decide who will be picked lands on just the boy. Apparently I found out in some research, because I was wondering earlier today, what happened to Watto? And it's all over the place because of canon versus legend stuff, so I'm just not even going to get into it. But apparently, long story short, those were weighted dice, so I didn't know that. So the fact that they didn't land on the expected number, or in this case, caller, that's especially why uh, Wada was kind of pissed off about it. What if Qui-Gon wasn't listening and got the colors wrong? And then he's like, oh, red, that means the mother. And all of a sudden it rolls again yeah. to blue. And he's like, oh, maybe, wait, actually, I was wrong. It was red. And then it rolls back to red. And he's like, wait a second. Red, no blue, no red. He just, he just like tries to cut the difference. And he like changes it so it like balances on one edge. He's like, I'll see both. Qui-Gon's finally like, OK, let's just cut the act. Like, you know, I'm doing this. Give me the kid. It's like, I know that your dice are cheating and that you know that I'm using the force. Like, let's get past this. I do know at least um, Watto's fate, the little that I do know, because it kind of splits between both canon and not. Um, after losing the race and all that, Anakin was a huge employee in the store and he just couldn't make ends meet. And it he it, he pretty much fell into hard times afterward. I don't know and what all of those children eat him alive. The ones that come by just to be like, "Hey, Anakin, what you working on?" By the way, none of us have trust in you. Bye, bye. <laughs> this didn't have switchblade. In one of the comics, it's insinuated that Vader kills him, but I don't know. It would make sense, but it's not <laughs> what a seen. Grudge. It's just implied. For Vader to, like, become Vader and then later come all the way back to track down Watto and be like, oh, by the way. By the way. It makes a lot of sense. Anakin, you're a Sith, huh? What do you know? <laughs> Watto, I'm looking for work. <laughs> so the race begins. Um, all the racers are going up to the starting line. Um, Greg Proops is one of the announcers, or half of the say, announcer. I, yeah. A yeah, very I thought that sounded very like his voice. recognizable. Yep, I, it was a nice uh, little thing to see him in. And he reprises his role for that announcer several times, too. Like in the Pod Racer N64 game, it's, it's him in it. Because that's what, Fode and Bead? I didn't, Are the, the two heads? I don't know. Everyone's got a name in here. Even the skull that Luke throws to shut the Rancor door has a name. But I, I, I don't <laughs> know about that. Jimmy! Gary! <laughs> <laughs> Um, this, uh, is an extended cut, like I mentioned in the beginning of the show. More racers are mentioned during, like, the whole, uh, announcement phase. The sequence is cut, and, um, it, but all of the racers are mentioned. More racers are, this is an extended cut, but the full cut is just, uh, deleted. So we have a moment with Anakin and his mother, who's worried about her son's safety, which, obviously... Qui-Gon offers his first Jedi lesson to Anakin to feel, don't think, and to trust his instincts. Um, Jar Jar is given a fart joke. Reminder, this is a kid's movie. Um, then the announcer introduces the racers to the crowd and welcomes Jabba the Hutt la, 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 to kick off the race. Um, with the sound of a gong, the race begins. Anakin stalls I'm grab out. that as a sound effect. <laughs> Can you imagine just like clip that real quick? Every every single time like he's mentioned, it's just that's how you announce Job of the Hut. La 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 la. <laughs> My last name. Um, just like in Mario Kart, where like it, the lights go down and the race starts, and you hit the button, it gives you a speed boost. Anakin tried <laughs> doing that, and he fucked up. So he he stalls out while all the other racers just um shoot off from the starting line. That lands Anakin in last place uh, while the others race forward. Um, I love this whole sequence. And like I mentioned before with Darth Maul's ship, the Sith Infiltrator, like I just love the sound design of this sequence and movie. And I often use this entire sequence just to test out speakers whenever I'm doing like audio checks on certain things. Mm -hmm. It's pretty it's, awesome. Like, it's, the, like I, the air breaking sound is incredible. I remember as a kid yeah. going into like Sears with my parents and they would have all the TVs set up. And for a while, this was like, I don't know, like 2001 or 2000 or whatever. 
once it hit like home video, they had all of these as like the sample thing of look at all of our new televisions and it's just playing the pod racer scene. Yeah, I mean, also at the time, like like from a technical standpoint, like that was a really well done sequence, like yeah. in terms yep. of like the the CGI and effects and like the modeling. But like also like, can we talk about pod racers for a second? It's just like a little car, a little convertible car that you strapped two jet engines to <laughs> with like metal ropes. And then you just said, yeah, that's good. Like, go for it. Yeah, it's just like, let's just it's strap two ben rockets. Her. Yeah, it's jet sleds. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jet sleds. Yeah, exactly. If Ben-Hur had rockets. <laughs> Then I would watch it. I mean, we we have like a version of that now. Have you seen the chariot races with motorcycles? No, but I just imagine no. like strapping SpaceX rockets to uh, the side of like a like a computer chair and you know trying to navigate <laughs> I through mean, I guess that's Grand the Canyon equivalent. that way. But yeah, but they do. They have chariots that you replace the horses with motorcycles. Mm. Jesus Christ! Yeah. I don't I, think it's hugely widespread. I think it's like one of those things that's like one of the events at a monster truck rally. I uh, I would watch that. Oh, yeah, I would I'm watch not, that too. I'm not in the UFC or NASCAR, but honestly, if I was going to get into like an extreme sport like that, I think I would watch pod racing if there was a, a real world equivalent anyway. And yet we end up with Quidditch. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the thing is, is that like, I feel like it's not a thing you'd go to see live though, because Quidditch or the pod race pod race because like they're only there for like three seconds and then you're just watching it on the tv it's like there's no real reason to be there yeah i mean they do the formula one races and stuff so i don't know oh that's true formula one you can't see them although I, that's like rally too right mm. you never see the car in rally races except for that like one time when it almost hits you <laughs> <laughs> what was that dean you said you know it seems like his mom is concerned for him. My only real gripe with the pod race scene is is two things: the the shots of them watching him on their little uh, camera iPad. tracker, yeah, iPad, They're weird. and some of the shots of Anakin himself. Like he he he's, he seems like he's kind of making oopsie faces at times when it's like really life threatening, yeah, or like classic, really like, dangerous situations. When... It's like, oh yeah, man, like, that guy Ooh. died. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> but then the shots of the like he's like almost dying like his things on fire and it shows the shots of the mom and she's just like kind of watching passively yeah i know i feel well i well, feel like there was just okay a, there's some bad directing we're like okay anakin <laughs> or like okay hey uh hey, mom. No, okay jake like your pod's out of control and we're gonna do a close-up of your face you need to look really distraught and the kid just like ah. <laughs> The same look as like Alicia yeah, Silverstone, like scrape against the car. She looks back, like, yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, it's like exactly was, the face of a man. He was yeah. not fully prepped as to the severity, <laughs> especially when in the extended editions, when they upped the severity <laughs> of him spinning out of control. Because in the wow, I have blood on my hands. <laughs> Okie dokie. Yeah, because in the theatrical, it's just like, oh man, that, that hubcap or whatever fell off and you're losing power. Yeah. But in the extended, it's like, no, one of the cables that holds your convertible to the jet engine broke and you are spinning at like <laughs> 400 rpm and you're there's just like, like making like a mild grimace there's one or two shots of jake that just look like he doesn't know the camera's rolling <laughs> just like yeah. sitting there <laughs> and the thing is speeding through the canyons but uh that I, I mean other than that yes it is it is a pretty cool cool sequence yeah I like the Tuscan Raiders are posted up, like just taking pot shots at the racers. Another <laughs> fun funny, fact: a funny addition. They are firing real bullets. Everything They're else really? uses, yeah, everything else uses like blasters and stuff, but <laughs> not Tus real as to oh, the film. Oh, I, <laughs> I was just like, Jesus Christ, that was a choice. <laughs> George is just like, I want CGI for everything else, but the bullets got to be real. It's like they have to actually hit the pod. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna CGI in those ricochet effects. <laughs> oh my god! It's the only way to get his reaction real, <laughs> and yet it doesn't. <laughs> then she, it goes back to Jack. <laughs> so through, <laughs> through the pod race, um, you know, Anakin struggling to catch up. The first lap, uh, we see Sebulba playing dirty, and he's taking out other racers and shit. 
Um, fun fact: only there is only one death in this entire race. Um, only one, really? Only one. The, the guy with the family whose wife just came out of the hospital. Basically, so <laughs> uh, uh, Rats Tyrell um, is the one that Poor you guy. see. Um, they're in the cave, and then he screams. He puts his head up, and in a ball of fire. He is the only confirmed death. Everyone else is still alive. And there are some where it's just like, how do you walk away from that? Because that's, there's like one where he's in like a circular pod Mm -hmm. and he's, and you see his thing spin at like 15,000 RPMs and he, he walks away. He's okay. I was sure he was dead too. (laughs) I thought there was going to be at least three confirmed deaths, but it's just uh, only the one, the one guy who got the sad backstory. He's dead. Yep. This was going to be his last race, too. He was he was at least, <laughs> if I remember correctly, um, his people put up like a, a shrine in his honor, and they were very proud of him for attempting the race. Hmm. I forgot Vern, not Vern. Um, Vern Troyer. He was Warwick the- <laughs> Davis makes in a, he's a little cameo here in this during yep. this scene. You actually get to see his face. He also plays yeah. um, the young Rodian. That is Anakin's friend, and I do believe he also plays Greedo as well, the young Greedo in this. But that scene was also cut. Do you guys I like just, Greedo? I just thought back to the conversation earlier where the, the George Lucas was like, "Do you want to see your favorite character as kids?" That's what I was just saying. <laughs> do you guys like Greedo? <laughs> Greedo was a little kid. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was in hindsight, I kind of wish they did a little scene. Where it was like a, a parent comes out and they're like, you guys stop roughhousing. And he's like, well, Greedo shot me first. <laughs> <laughs> and then they all Who looked into the camera. Greedo. <laughs> I think that's actually said. I don't remember. It's been a while since I've seen that scene. And I actually forgot about that one until just now. Uh-huh. Um, I try to mention all the deleted stuff as we happen to it. I don't know if that happens after the race or um, just before it. But yeah, um, you see a little Rodian come out and starts beating the shit out of Anakin. and. Um, Anakin like defends himself whatever I don't remember the context of the fight itself but we find out that that re- Rodian is actually Greedo and is a little baby Chated. so he think... beat up a kid that his son will later come kill him or his uh, buddy will later come kill him who's buddy essentially Han his Luke's son's buddy Han I think Han. um uh p- I think part of the weird thing about with Anakin in the scene is I feel like the um, props and wardrobe team designed his helmet before he was ever cast. And they're just like, well, this is going to have to work because <laughs> it just kind of looks a little awkward on him, like huge. And like, you don't really get to see his eyes. So mm. I didn't feel I think that it way. I takes thought it away. Would. Uh, it just seems like I can't see his face while he's racing. You I know, but like, I feel like you could do that with a smaller helmet and goggles that are around his eyes more. True. Well, the goggles, they do nothing. <laughs> yeah, they're, it, it's basically like if they just put a small pane of glass on a, like, on a standard, like, bracket. And we're just like, here you go. Goes up and down. I like how after the race, too, you see how filthy his face is, except for where the goggles were. Mm. Can you imagine, like, swallowing a bug at that speed? Well, also, at that speed, how is he breathing? Like, can you imagine opening your mouth to take a breath with, like, 145 miles an hour of air just <laughs> blasting into your face? Does he have I a mean, wind- it's got to be faster than that, shoots? even. Yeah, I mean, when I walk outside and I go to take a breath and the wind blows towards me and I'm like, <gasps> and I choke for a second, and I can't imagine doing that of, like, okay, for the next 25 minutes, you're just going to be screaming at 500 miles an hour. So, so apparently, apparently it's, it's got to be so fast because he's the only human with reflexes fast enough to do it, which means... They are well over six, seven hundred miles an hour. Anakin's pod racer, apparently on this Google search, if I type in pod racer speed, he is going five hundred and eighty eight miles per hour. Holy shit. One hundred so like commercial airliner an airplane. Airplane. convertible. Yeah. <laughs> his pod his pod is over a hundred kilometers per hour faster than Sebulba's. So in comparison to all the other ones, that is insane on terms of speed. Yeah, so to give you also like some context. So NASCAR is 200 miles an hour. Yeah. In a convertible. Um, <laughs> if, yeah, if, and the windshield does pebble, not cover his face. <laughs> if a pebble or some sand kicked up, he would die. <laughs> it would go through him like rocks through paper. 
What if that's what Anakin did? He got ahead of them and took like a handful of pebbles and then just threw it behind his ship. And it just is just buckshot that goes through all the other pilots. You know, like a handful of marbles. <laughs> well, I mean, Sebulba does that though, with like a wrench. He does. Yeah. And it blows up a pod racer. <clears throat> yeah, let's see. There's this YouTube video here where it like showcases the speeds of all of them because he tries to extrapolate with math. And the Vulpterine 327's top speed is 473 miles per hour. So that is that is some insane speed. I don't know whose ship that is. That's one of the it's mentioned in the announcement thing, but I don't know whose is whose, but yeah. Wait, I mean it makes sense. You're like taking the engines off a spacecraft and just attaching it to your like Yeah, with a magnetic beam just keeping them everything together. Yeah, like that. Isn't physics cool? Ain't it cool? Only on a hot planet. <laughs> so during the race, um, uh, spoiler Anakin wins um, <gasps> we see Aura Singh getting her two seconds of fame and this she's on screen for like two literally two seconds and that is enough for just fan appeal of kind of like Boba Fett where she got her own storyline and story arc through the Clone Wars she ends up uh, connecting with Boba and they have like this um, I don't want to say bounty hunting guild but they have like a like a just a group that they all kind of rely on each other and she's one of them that she works with, the younger Boba Fett in 10 years to come. Rhett's Tyrell dies. Ben Quadraneros is officially lapped on lap two. Odie Mandrell is taken out because of his pit crew droids that are supposed to be amazing. They walk right into the intake. The concept of a pit in this sport is interesting because it's only three laps. Also, they don't have <laughs> tires. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh he he's coming into the pit i'm like dude you got three laps <laughs> yeah but also if you have jet engines going 550 yeah. miles an hour that's probably tearing the thing apart just existing like okay. you you can't make up time in three laps well anakin like, did he, well no he didn't stop for a pit like no but he didn't start for at least like 30 seconds oh that's a good point yeah mm -hmm. yeah and he somehow, I don't but he know, does maybe, have an insanely fast pod race. Maybe yeah. it's like a, a four thousand mile track. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we don't have a gauge pit, on the distance. The pit losing, is to replace the pilot after the first one dies from sand. For losing <laughs> um, thirty seconds in the first lap, um, he came in third by what was it? What, no, I think he came in like fifth in the third, the first lap. And then he came in third in the second. And then that's when he came in first and the last. I kind of want to figure out the math for that. Because <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think of like a 30. It exist. Like if you're traveling 500 miles an hour. Oh boy, this is some algebra. Here we go. <laughs> that that video covers it. I'll share it in the thing later. So, uh, well, the whole race is in real time, right? You can just um, yeah. time the race and then, yeah, you can do the math from there. Yeah, because they, um, they mentioned like the lap speeds and all that too. So I think it's like two, one minute, like 130 seconds for lap one, and like 120 seconds for lap two or something like that. Yeah. So first lap is, um, so 148 seconds. Second lap is 159 seconds. And the third lap is 231 seconds. So eh, they're going fast. Yeah. So Anakin wins. Uh, there's a little Easter egg that comes up again during the Mandalorian, I think, or Book of Boba Fett, whichever, whatever, regarding Din Djarin's journey in whatever Disney show that he's in at the time. Um, <laughs> Anakin is forced onto the service ramp and he crashes through the, the gate that prevents people from going up and they shouldn't be going up there. And that same gate is later seen in with Din Djarin when he's testing out his new uh, repaired Naboo Starfighter that he's using instead of having the whatever it's called the razor crest so that was a cool little Wait, knot to see was it smashed at that time uh or is it like just repaired to say don't go up there again no it's um it's it's fully intact during this time during episode one anakin crashes through it and then flash forward 30 years um okay yeah 30 years to um din Djarin's that's time. right because luke's around that's right yeah and that's when that happens and then yeah anakin wins the race 
um when Watto meets with Qui-Gon for Qui-Gon to collect his winnings and all that um we see a probe droid that was released by Maul in the background and Watto tries to back out on his deal but um Qui-Gon's like well I'll just bring it up with the huts then and Watto immediately is like all right fine take the kid it wasn't fair for any of this. You knew something was going on, but whatever. So with Anakin's freedom in hand, um, Qui-Gon goes back to um, Anakin's house. Uh, his mother is told that, hey, he's set free now. And then I like how he's like, mom, can I go? And she's like, kid, this is your path, not mine. I mean, if you want to do this, go for it. So Anakin, of course, is like, hey, do you want to be a hey, kid? Do you want to be a Jedi? Fuck yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, he definitely... He he left without really looking twice back. Well, I like his C-3PO goodbye. <laughs> okay, bye. I'll make sure mom doesn't try to sell you or anything. Don't sell me. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> A deleted scene happens here. So as Anakin and Qui-Gon leave, the deleted scene is as they're leaving Mos Espa, Qui-Gon realizes that the probe is following them. He like turns around and he slices it in half. And that's where Qui-Gon realized that they're being tracked and they need to get the fuck out. And that explains why in the very next scene, the two of them are running through a desert instead of just walking. And because of that deleted scene. So as they're running toward the ship, <laughs> Qui-Gon looks back and he sees somebody approaching on a land speeder. He tells the kid to drop. And that's where we see Darth Maul in his glory for the very first time. He jumps off the thing, ignites his lightsaber, and they start attacking the desert for some, like really cool ass shots. Witness me in my glory. Uh, we see some legendary skills of Ray Park. Um, deleted scene as well as here where Maul does follow Qui-Gon up the ramp of the ship as it's flying away. And that's why we see Maul rising to his full height because he got kicked off the ramp. And that's why Qui-Gon is collapsed on the floor when Obi-Wan arrives. They are now fully repaired, ready to go. Why do they, why do they cut that out? Timing, I guess. Pacing. Hmm. Anakin carves a necklace for Padme and gives it to her, showing his affection for her really got the hots for this chick crew arrives at coruscant and they're greeted by palpatine and the chancellor played by terrence stamp they're here to finally plead their case to the senate palpatine preps padme on expectations while the jedi go off to the council to report on what happened on tatooine and as they do the council is not sold on them being attacked by a sith they're like nah you're playing dog they don't they're not around ain't no sith here so you and they want to see skywalker see if they should train him or not um padme is queen again at this point in time so every time we see the queen that is padme um palpatine and padme plead their case to the senate but bureaucracy and politics land their pleas on deaf ears um padme then calls for a vote of no confidence in valorum which gets passed and immediately voted on um during the calls for the senate to vote now this is where we see david's um Easter egg where we see E.T. in one of the Senate pods. Was was there was there anything we missed or like I missed or just not talked about that the Chancellor like people didn't like him? Was that like mentioned? Not really. Are they just I reacting think, to this whole to this whole thing? I think there was enough civil discourse with him and just kind of like how current events are now between Biden and Trump and all that and just people aren't happy. And with this specific right. situation, she had the grounds to call for basically an, an immediate impeachment. Like, this, is, I'm done. Like, you know what? Because of your inaction, I'm going to call this. And everyone else was like, you know what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, let's let's vote him out. It's true. Like, the chancellor didn't seem bad. He just was very politics. And and suddenly you got Padme, Padme coming in like Marjorie Taylor Greene being like, ah, impeach him. Ah. <laughs> yeah, but just, Let me bring my she, guns into the Senate. <laughs> she had no real power, right? She just kind of influenced with her speech. And then was like, yeah, we're yeah. going to do this. Well, yeah, because she's right. not even a senator. She technically no. has no voting power there. Right. She just got him riled up. Yeah. Right? She's basically like if a mayor showed up to the federal Senate <laughs> or a governor. Yeah, governor is more likely. So once the vote is, you know, once she calls for that, Palpatine whispers in Padme's ear that now they'll vote for a stronger chancellor. Like me. Meanwhile, back at the, the Jedi Council, Anakin is tested. <laughs> Digression. I always was curious on how traffic was directed on Coruscant because you could see all the ships in the traffic lanes in the background. <laughs> and especially on how, like, some ships can just kind of go wherever they need to go, but the rest have to stay in the traffic lanes. I always wanted to just see, like, 
Coruscant Traffic Cop, the TV show, and I just want to experience that for like a couple episodes. There isn't one. What you don't see is if you go into all of those ships, it's just the driver screaming nonstop. <laughs> Like there's never traffic, but they're not going fast either, and it's a big planet. Like how do you how do you get on the other side of the planet? So Anakin's being tested, and there he's asked questions and stuff. And the Jedi are not really sold on him, and it's pretty clear. But Qui Gon is like, this is the chosen one. This is the guy that's going to bring balance to the Force. I found him. Let's train him. But the Jedi are like, mm, pump the brakes. So back at the apartment of Pat, uh, Palpatine, news is told that the election is down to just three candidates. And just like real life with Trump versus Bernie Sanders and Biden, um, the worst choice is kind of selected here. <laughs> um, well, we don't know about the other two candidates. There's probably, there might be. A- well, only team of Malastair is um, the Trade Federation guy. And then Bail Antilles oh. is... is um, yeah, he's oh, not. Oh, that's right. Until he's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, yeah. so because the other guy's in the pocket of Big Federation and they call this vote, their nominee is another guy from the Trade Federation? Yeah. Bail and Tilly's would yeah, have been the, the best uh, choice, but. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's not. Meanwhile, Bale... you've got, you've got like Libertarian Federation. <laughs> yeah. And Palpatine, which is. Fucking and Palpatine. Great. Yeah. So Padme's frustrated, and she's like, fuck this, I'm going to take the planet back myself without the Senate's aid. Until I saw this, I didn't realize, like, Padme, even from the very beginning, was pretty badass oh, yeah. of just, oh, I'm going to play both of these hands, and I'm going to have the decoy thing, and I'm going to just decide, like, fine, if you won't do this, I'll go do this. But what if you die? Then I'll die. I'll die with my people. And it's like, okay, yeah, cool. Like, you go stick to your guns there. I shall die as one of them. Yeah, I mean, she didn't want to. She didn't want to leave in the first place, right? No, she didn't. Because, like, when the decoy, like when Qui Gon's trying to convince the decoy, um, I can't remember what the decoy says, but then Padme pipes in, is like, "Oh no, we're brave, Your Highness." Yeah, which that, is definitely that was... the no. I want to stay. No, that was the um, that was the conversation where that was like i don't know if we should leave the planet or not and that was the code word for let's go oh was it oh i was thinking it was the other way around yeah because she understood that they couldn't do anything here maybe with the backing of the senate they can help and she realizes like this is stupid i'm not going to get anywhere with this so fuck it i'm just going to do my own thing anyway and i'm going to take the planet back myself and i even like how palpatine is like no you mustn't come back it has almost that same vibe of like when wonka was like no wait come back no, oh, yeah. <laughs> no, please don't. Oh, no. <laughs> so that night, the council deliberates Anakin's training, and they say that he's just, he's too old. It's not going to work. And um, the blanket statement that the I, Jedi Council I makes. I hate the ongoing stuff with he's the Jedi in all of wrinkles. the different media of like, oh, you have to get rid of all emotions, everything that has an emotion. You have to get rid of it, and also, like, anything we say goes, and otherwise you'll be labeled a traitor. And it's like, the Jedi Order was just a different version of bad. They just weren't as outright bad as the Sith. I mean, it's, yeah, and it's this is setting up their downfall. The You know, it's tragic, and the Clone Wars gives a lot of empathy and compassion to all these characters that you understand their backstories and all that, and it's really sad when, like, Order 66 happens and you see like your favorite characters getting gunned down and killed. But the whole thing to Order 66 when it eventually happens is is that the Jedi were too arrogant. They were too blind and they were just so high up on their own pedestal that they placed themselves that they couldn't see a lot of things that's directly in front of them. And this kind of keys into that. And you really see a lot of their arrogance here. And it's like, no, this is our set of stone ways. This is how it's going to be. This is how it's been working so well. It's just the problem is it hasn't been working well and they're too blind to see it. I'm 100% behind you with that. I, I remember being like all for the Jedi when I was younger. And then like it kind of switched with me once I realized like the Jedi kind of suck. And they just mm-hmm. they're so hyper focused on their own ways that it's going to literally be their downfall and it eventually does cuz order 66 have, hadn't been created yet by the time i realized it but, i also i also feel like like the jedi council's reach is real small i feel like they're they're very much a we don't practice what we preach kind of system yeah where it's just like yeah when you're in the council room and you're a trainee 
yeah, there's lots of rules and everything's really hard. But then like once you're a knight, it's like, yeah, fucking whatever. <laughs> just do your thing. And between all the different cultures that are out there and just living like and trying to police and do everything out in the field, it's so hard to stick to the book at all times. It's just it's an impossibility. There's no way you can do it. Yeah. And like if you're a Jedi doing missions on the outer rim, like nobody's checking in on you. Like I don't know. I think I think it's like a it's real strict and then you graduate high school and then it's like all right like whatever <laughs> yeah so obi-wan please that the boys <laughs> oh yeah the, the jedi council say that you know he, he's too old we're not gonna do it and qui-gon's like well fuck that i'm gonna do it anyway they're about to leave the coruscant to head back and obi-wan is like pleading you know the boy's dangerous and it made me laugh because the kid's right there <laughs> <laughs> the boy's a menace I'm in the room, Obi-Wan. Like, Obi-Wan doesn't really talk to Anakin at all through the entire movie. But it's like, yo, this kid is, the kid's a problem. Why are you doing this? And it's like, dude, I can hear you. And the kid's even like, I don't want to be a problem, sir. And it's like, well, don't worry about Obi-Wan. He asks about many chlorians. It's fully explained here. They're just like receptors to the force. The more of them you have in your body, the more strong you are in them, the force you are going to be with it. And then they go back to Naboo. Meanwhile, Gunray is explaining to Sidious that the planet is now fully under their control. Sidious sends Darth Maul to assist them. When the Jedi and the Queen land in the forest of Naboo, um, Jar Jar tries to find the Gungans and he realizes that they left the city and they went to like their sacred place. And at this point, um, Kira Knightley is the Queen and they find Boss Nass and the Gungans. And she tries to plead their case to him, but he's not swayed and blames the them for all the droids and stuff but this is where padme steps forward revealing that she's actually the real queen and um i love that subtle look that qui-gon gives obi-wan because it's as if obi-wan or it's as if qui-gon just won five bucks in a bet padme literally bends the knee for boss nas to lend his aid and he agrees joyously because he realizes like oh you guys aren't better than our you guys don't think that you're better than us and you really want our help and it's the first like olive branch toward peace and equality because uh um, Boss Nass in the originally when they were in Odogunga asking for like, hey, we need to get the Thede. Boss Nass's big stance on us is like, no, they think they're better than us. They think their brains are so big and, you know, they sit in a high and mighty castle whereas we're like down in the swamps and they don't treat us like equals. Why should we help you with this? And when Kira Knightley was just pleading to Boss Nass for that same thing, like, look, we got to we need your help with your army to take out the droids. They didn't want to at first. and finally. He understands, like, oh, cool, you guys are on our side. We can do this. Back with Nuke Gunray, he tells Palpatine what Padme is doing, and uh, Sidious warns Maul, like, you know, just let them make the first move before they attack, before we attack, rather, and figure out what's going on. She's too aggressive. Uh, the Gungans meet in the Naboo. The Gungans meet the Naboo in a field to go over the battle details. So how the whole thing is going to work is that the Gungans are going to head out, head on the droid army away from the city and be a distraction while Padme's group will take, like, a smaller guerrilla force to retake the palace. I do like this, like, open field green grass fight. It's like they're fighting on the Windows XP background. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't see any gorillas. <laughs> uh, when they're trying to retake the palace, they're also going to break into the hangar and launch starfighters to take out the droid control ship. So Sidious um, orders the droid army to attack. Once they realize, like, oh, they're amassing an army out in the fields over there. And he's like, all right, go, go kill them. So he sends the droids out to do that with Captain Tarples getting into position and showcasing massive creatures with huge shield generators to deflect incoming tank fire, which I thought was really cool. I like how there's, like, no music for this segment, too. And it really does mm -hmm. help until the droid army, like, fully deploys. I always liked how, in some cases... And specifically in movies like this, where there's a huge fight happening, sometimes the lack of music can really aid in setting the tone for a, a specific scene. And just the dead yeah. silence and hearing the just pure sound design, because all of this, none of this is real. So there's no live action thing here. It's 100% CG, 100% animated. So seeing just like the shields go up, all the droid, the Gungans, you know, set up stance and defense. Then you see the tanks deploy all the droids, and that's when the music kicks in. But leading up to that point, you see the tanks firing, 
hitting the shield and like hearing that sound of like the energy dispersing over the shield. I love that sound effect. And it's just really cool leading up to that point where finally the music starts going. It's like, oh shit, you know, now, you know, it's on. I wish they had gone full, like saving private Ryan with the gun gun. It's just like, <laughs> you know, a gun gun trying to put his insides back in, <laughs> you know, in their world, they did. And they talk about yeah. this battle. Like it's the battle of Normandy. Yeah. <laughs> This goes a hard left turn into violence. <laughs> so while the field battle is happening, the city attack begins with Padme. The team slowly carve their way into the hangar. Anakin finds cover inside a vacant starfighter while the ground team pushes forward. And once the entire hangar is cleared out, the pilots break from the group, get into starfighters, and they start launching into orbit to take out the control ship. Back in the field, seeing that the range fire can't break the shield, the droid transport releases battalions of battle droids. Um, I think a quick number, each one deployed at least 64, and there's like seven or eight different uh, carriers, so that's that's just a lot of battle droids. They walk through the shields because they're energy shields. They're not like ray shields. Physical. Yeah, so they're able yeah. to just walk right through, and the battle for Naboo actually begins. So once Padme's group retakes the hangar, they proceed to the palace throne, but they're cut off by Darth Maul. And now we get to cue one of, if not the best, lightsaber fight in Star Wars history, with Darth Maul igniting not one, but both ends of his lightsaber to face off against Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan. And the birth of one of the best pieces of Star Wars music. Yes. That's seeing, also true. Seeing this fight for the first time... I actually didn't like the two-on-one choreography. I liked the one-on-one -on -one choreography better when it's just Obi-Wan. Because it feels like when it's 2v1, it's almost like they're taking turns attacking. That it didn't feel as fluid as I was hoping. Oh, Because you always end up running is... into that situation of like, okay, I attack, and now there needs to be a reason on why we're not both attacking. So like, I get kicked, but then I'll stand there and I'll like huff and puff for a couple seconds while you swing, then I go into swing. Well, that's, th this fight doesn't have that. That's the thing. And that's what makes it so much more awesome once they're separated and it is one-on-one. -on -one. Because Maul intentionally knows, and they attack in unison at every opportunity, but Maul keeps pushing Obi-Wan back. He knows that Obi-Wan is probably the more faster fighter, so he's going to have a rougher time with him. Every opportunity, like, Obi-Wan spins his lightsaber at one point. Like, he does, like, a twirl to swing, but Maul kicks him right in the face. And you actually see it on camera. Like, he then that disables him for at least, like, five seconds and then he, maul is constantly um backpedaling to gain more ground and he's trying to keep the two jedi separated at all times he's intentionally trying to separate them so that they're not attacking but whenever they can they do attack at the same time and he's forced to take the defense whenever they're like surrounding him and that's why at one point when um they're on the bridge that's when he finally like kicks or punches obi-wan over the edge so that now he only gets to fight Qui-Gon one-on-one, and then he gets pushed back through the rest of the fight until they get to the uh, the laser hallway. But at the same time, seeing the the um, the two v one, once it finally does get to those one v one sections, it ramps it up even further because it's like you see how amazing it is leading up to that point. I feel the fight, especially between Obi Wan and Darth Maul after Qui-Gon is killed, that is. I like that fight better than the Obi-Wan Anakin fight in episode three. Everyone hyped that one up and it is good, but I feel that one is more flashy with just like a lot of spinning and it's a lot less of, um, it just seems like there's more choreography than he's trying to kill you kind of choreography. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm rewatching the fight right now. I do like how at one point when they do the wide shot of them backing him towards the um when he keeps backing up backing up backing up and then they come to the wide shot and all of a sudden you see him like misstep and almost just fall off the side and he stumbles and gets his footing again and i don't know if that's intentional or if that was like oh no what he was standing on he actually started to trip over this thing because i could only imagine <laughs> if it was just like and trip and then he just goes over the side and they're just Whoops. like oh oh okay <laughs> casey jones is on the bottom waiting to flip the switch <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I got to say, like, I do still think it's probably one of the most iconic sequences in Star Wars, like both like just visually from like the 
the crazy like catwalks with the, the pillars of energy and the like the shield hallway um i do on rewatch i think some parts of the fight choreography have aged better than other parts yes absolutely there's watching some parts where it's just like, oh, you could have done that a little bit better. There's like one shot where it's um, Obi Wan, uh, Obi Wan Anakin. It's Obi Wan Maul, and you go to see he holds his lightsaber out. It's just yeah, he it doesn't make contact fast enough, so it just looks like it's choreography. Then the whole rest of the fight is just like pure seamless, and it does look like they're actually trying to kill each other, and it's not just flashy choreography to make it look like a, a stereotypical fight scene. Yeah, but I mean, like, Ray Park does a great job with it. I mean, it's what he does, really, kind of one of the only good things he does is fight choreography. Yeah. Or, like, fight sequences. Yeah. Um, That one shot of his where um, it's right at the beginning of the fight where the door is closed, leading to the energy room. Not the hallway, but, like, the big, big one. You know, mm. he spins the thing right in front of him, and then he, like, he turns back, he force lifts, like, some debris that's on the ground, and he throws it into the door control i love that shot i don't know why it's nothing special or great but just like the sheer ferocity in his face when you see him do that and then once the door opens up you can tell like oh i'm fucking ready let's do this yeah i don't i don't think there's too much i'm not bothered by much of the choreography on rewatch it was the first time too that we had seen anything like that mm -hmm. you know um of this this fast pace yeah um the the rest of the seek the sequel the rest of the prequel lightsaber fights are very flashy they're faster we kind of grew a company to that because just like lucas's um directing style you know faster more intense all the lightsaber fights after this one do get <laughs> faster and more intense but leading up to that point you know we saw the fights with um you know, just like them taking out the droids and all that. But I mean, Empire Strikes Back, Vader was toying with Luke that entire lightsaber fight. The one in A New Hope was with experimental technology to make it look different. And those things were literally like glass rods that if they were to mm -hmm. bang them too hard, they would have shattered and broke. So they couldn't go crazy with it. And then the same thing, like the Return of the Jedi was a little bit better and it was much faster paced compared to the other two movies, but nothing in comparison to what we have seen in episode one. So just seeing that sets such a high standard that this is the first time we're ever seeing something like this. And it's just so awe inspiring that it's like, this is amazing. Oh, yeah. And, and I don't even think the other prequels do as good of a job. Like no. I'm thinking about in the episode three, the Anakin Dooku fight. No, it's episode two. The episode two Dooku fight. It's like it's cut in so close and it's lit to try and be super dramatic. Yeah. But it's just really dark. You don't get to see the fight. Yeah. Um, because they're I mean, they're not trying to showcase the fight. They're trying to like get to like the I guess the dark emotion of it, mm -hmm. which I eh, I have different feelings on. But um we never really see another fight like this in the prequels. We don't. I don't think um, we see another fight like this, period. And I know some of, I know I'm going to get hit in the comments with like, you know, the Obi-Wan Anakin fight in episode three is iconic. And it is. It absolutely is. I'm not saying anything against it, but just the tone of that fight versus this one, it just feels different in terms of how it was structured. And it's just, it's so, like, I like it a lot, but it's just with how flashy and just the way that it was scripted in that movie versus this one. This one really feels like they're trying to kill each other. You know, every other mm. choreography, it's just, I'm going to move my blade here. You're going to hit it. And then I'm going to move it here. And then you're going to hit it. And then you're going to pull yours back. And I'm going to hit your blade. You could tell they're aiming for each other's weapon blades instead of the actual person. And in this one, it specifically feels like that's not the case. They're actually trying to hit the other person. And especially in episode three, it's just there's like one scene where you just see them spinning the blue and it's just a blur of blue the entire fight. And it doesn't really feel like they're Anakin is pissed. I get it. But it doesn't feel like he actually is trying to kill Obi-Wan and it doesn't feel like Obi-Wan's trying to kill Anakin and stop him through any of this. There's mm. a few scenes where it is amazing and it's you actually have to slow it down to see because I know in, in episode three, Anakin does the same move that he did to uh, Count Dooku when he cut off his hands yeah, mm -hmm. before he killed him. He does the same exact thing to Obi-Wan, but Obi-Wan realizes this and he, or 
he doesn't realize it, but he he's two steps ahead and he doesn't allow Anakin to do that to him. So he gets to keep his hands and the fight continues on. But it's early on in the fight. Anakin is trying to kill him, but it's just it doesn't have that same effect in my head. I don't know. Hmm. So if ever there was a time to use force run down a hall, it's when <laughs> it's when Obi-Wan gets stopped well, by I think, that last I think that just uh, proves that it was Qui-Gon was door. pushing him right. and pulling him. <laughs> I guess right. The the force come on, let's go. So they just it, Obi-Wan hasn't had a long rest yet, and he can only do that once <laughs> per long rest. So they've been going this whole time. Really. This whole time. I mean I'm just surprised why they didn't like why didn't they just both force push Maul when he kept backing up, backing up, backing up? And it's like, just force push him over the side of that crater. Well, I think it's so funny because like, I, I, it's also, I don't, neither one of them has shown that kind of creativity, really. Like, it's funny because like, we see that creativity come from Vader a lot. Yeah. I think that's all he can do at this at this point. Well, like, he'll be fighting someone and like, I think uh, it might have been from one of the games. So maybe not really canon. But like he's he'll be in a lightsaber fight and he'll be like, oh, you know, that's it looks pretty even. And then he'll just he'll just use the force to paralyze your hand so you can't fight. <laughs> you start punching your own face and he and it's just like, oh, he wasn't he was just having fun. Like Vader is much more creative in how he uses it. Yeah, he force pushes one leg, force pulls the other, forces you to do a split and then he beheads you. <laughs> Wow, um, these comics have really gotten ridiculous. I don't want to fight you anymore, so I'm just going to rip the shit off the walls and throw it at you. Yeah. So while this fight's happening, um, it, back in the hangar, Droidicus arrive, um, preventing Padme's escape, or rather Padme's advance. Anakin is now in that starfighter, and uh, he kind of, all oh, like, this was actually intentional. He realizes that he's in a massive gun. So he turns on the ship, and he tries to aim it at um, the droids, but he accidentally turns on the autopilot. So after destroying the droidicas, because the ship's guns are way stronger than the shields that uh, the droidicas have, he accidentally joins the space flight that's in orbit. So now we have the four different groups. There's, there's three groups. So the Jedi fight, the droid versus Gungan army, and then Anakin arriving to the space battle. We overhear the Naboo pilots saying that they can't pierce the droid control ship shields, which was warned by Qui-Gon, but they didn't listen. Padme is pushing to the throne room, and all the while that amazing John Williams score of Duel of the Fates is blasting in the background. So across all the battlefields, all the heroes are met with the scales tipping in favor of the enemy almost at the same time. So the Jedi and Maul fight. Um, Maul are locked into a like inside of a laser wall hallway, and each people each they're all separated. Um, Qui Gon and Darth Maul are like right like in adjacent rooms, whereas um, Obi Wan is like way off in the very beginning of that hallway because he got kicked off the platform and he just caught up. Anakin, in his I'll try spinning, that's a good trick, evasive maneuvers, finds himself inside the hangar of the uh, droid ship and uh, lands just outside the main reactor as his ship overheats, shutting down. Padme is held at gunpoint and taken to the Viceroy. The Jedi continue the fight. Obi-Wan is now forced to watch as Darth Maul and Qui-Gon fight through the final laser wall. Maul gains the upper hand and uh, stabs Qui-Gon through the chest. The Gungans are forced to surrender in the fields of uh, Naboo. Things aren't looking good for our heroes. Gunray tells Padme that she must sign the treaty, but is fooled by the Kira Knightley queen. She comes up and she's like, you know, ah, and he's like, oh, this is one's a decoy, which is, he was half right. Son of a bit. This one's a decoy. <laughs> as, as I think the line is delivered. <laughs> the distraction is enough for Padme to retake the situation. She kills the droid guards and now puts Viceroy under the gunpoint. And then the fight of the century, Obi-Wan Kenobi fights Maul one-on-one, -on -one, showcasing that amazing fight scene. Um, until the episode three fight, it's one of the best fights there are. The ones in episode two were good, but the episode three one was amazing too. Maul uses the force and pushes Kenobi down the central pit, forcing them to hang. Anakin's ship regains power and through collateral damage destroys the main reactor of the droid control ship. The chain reaction causes the ship to self-destruct, causing all the droids on the Naboo fields to shut down. The Kungan army cheer, claiming victory over their deactivated captors. And here uh, we get back to Darth Maul relishing his victory. Underestimates Obi-Wan as he jumps into the air. Obi-Wan grabs 
Qui-Gon's lightsaber with the Force and slices Maul in half. For those who haven't watched The Clone Wars, this isn't the last time we see Maul, and he isn't dead from this either. Super not dead. Uh, Obi-Wan rushes to Qui-Gon, but in his dying words, he pleads for Anakin to be trained, and he is the chosen one who will bring balance to the Force. So once everything is all said and done, they retake the palace. Palpatine arrives, and Padme hands Gunray over to Palpatine and the Senate police and all that. Padme congratulates Palpatine on his victory in the Senate, which, fun fact, after Palpatine is voted Chancellor, it's that night where Palpatine kills Darth Plagueis while he slept. They basically partied hard, huh. got drunk, and that's when Palpatine kills him in his sleep. I know he has reason to be happy about being Chancellor, but he's... <laughs> I know that there were, he was dealt some blows and his apprentice is killed, but he's really good. He's like chipper. He's like the most chipper you could be. <laughs> yeah i mean he's he, when he meets he's like really playing the part yeah and um even though he lost maul he didn't he doesn't care honestly because right that's, at this point a, he's a pawn anyway he realizes like he meets anakin and he already knows everything about anakin at this point behind the scenes and he's like oh we're gonna watch your career with great interest because he knows right. and it's like oh this is uh, this is the best day of palpatine's life next to order yeah. 66 <laughs> It's one one of Palpatine's holidays. Yeah, uh, I am super. I am super <laughs> glad that Maul does come back, as he would have been wasted. Yeah, yeah. as a character, had he not come back. Yeah, and Sam Witwer's um, performance as Maul has been phenomenal. Um, mm. I really enjoyed his entire oh, the voice acting. You mean? Yeah, his entire story arc in the Clone Wars and eventually the Rebels and back to Clone Wars um, was incredible, and it really kills me how. Um, the solo movie, he had a quick cameo in it, and that story has not been brought back up since because it's just the movie was panned. The movie really wasn't that bad, and it just sucks so bad that one of the best characters has more story that could be said, and it's just they're not doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is too bad. Yeah, Mole had a lot to offer, and like I remember reading the novel where he's introduced, and he was so cool. <laughs> And then it's like, oh, he's dead. It's like, oh, and then they bring him back, and it's like, oh, thank God. Like, yeah. he is so much, had so much potential, and did and did great things in, in the TV shows. Um, Marvel could certainly learn a little bit from keeping a villain around for a little longer. Like who? I mean, Mysterio, Modok. If they did real Modok and kept him around longer than just forty-five seconds in one film, as a joke. Oh. As a joke, as a joke throwaway character. Didn't he get a TV show, though? Or is that like just something that they it's, made? That's... It's bad. It's it's bad. Don't even look at it. Also, it's it's non-canon. It's, oh, it's I something think like separate. A cartoon. It's an animated style. Yeah. Yeah. Patton Oswalt as Modoc. It's too bad. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I mean, oh, uh, Ronan is a great character that we never really get to see anything from. Well, because they killed him in Galax or Guardians 1. Well, no, that's what I'm saying. Like, Marvel could learn a lot from keeping their villains around longer. Oh, 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 yeah. Yeah, a thousand percent. We could have gotten so much more out of Ronan just for the fact that then later when they do, like, well, so in the comics, oh, boy. when they ended up having Thanos and his Black Order come down, they end up forming all of the groups that oppose them, and one of the groups is Ronan the Accuser, joining the team along with like Anilis and all these other guys so when um i forgot what his name is in the movie but in the comics his name is black dwarf the one with like the hammer the hulk looking one mm. he ends up on the ship he faces off against all of them and ronin and then ronin is like you have been judged you have been accused and found wanton or whatever and then blows his head up with a hammer so it's like Ronan ends up doing a lot of cool stuff that we don't get to see, including a bunch of villains joining fights against Thanos's army. Uh, yeah, it's uh, Ronan is a very, very cool character that we he was just very one note because he was just filling a purpose. Well, also because they're using him as a joke, like towards the end of the movie, it's like they start making fun of him and then he's like, what, what what's going on? And it's like. It's so it's a stupid way to use the character that I didn't like his handling in Guardians. You know, that's, but yes. as a non-Marvel fan, that's really disappointing because I did not like him at all through Guardians 1. 
I thought he was a stupid villain, and knowing that he actually is so much better and he was wasted, that's really just yeah. He he goes on to do some really cool stuff. Like I w- I wasn't introduced to him until way later. There was a, a short comic run that was a series called Annihilation, which was broken into like four parts, like four equal parts that had like uh, Silver Surfer, Ronin, Galactus, and can't remember who the fourth one was. Um, and they kind of broke it into four parts to tell the story from each person's perspective. And I mean, I was into it because I'm a huge Silver Surfer fan. But then I saw Ronan's books coming out and I was like, oh, I don't really know him. Like, let me read these. And they were great. But That's too bad. Uh, all for all. I'm all for keeping villains around as long as they can, rather than these kind of one note, just plot antagonists. Which it was great seeing Maul come back because I think Clone, Clone Wars and Rebels, I think, were made so much better because of his inclusion. Yeah. And I know some people may not are thrilled with Dave Filoni's choice in a lot of things, but I mean, I really like on how he's able to fill in a lot of the gaps that were left blank. I mean, he was able to successfully dance around the fact that it's established in episode three that Anakin never meets General Grievous until that point in time. Hmm. And they developed an entire show that ran whatever, six, seven, nine seasons. And he always made sure that the two never met during that entire time. Like that is very specific on, you know, making sure that everything is well thought out and it's great. And his whole baloney verse is working well. It's just, it sucks on how currently now, like my biggest complaint after Ahsoka came out, currently in development, we're not going to get a continuation for the story for at least another like three, four years minimum. Like this sucks. Like it's your, your biggest cash cow in terms of story is just, it's so far out in the future that there's very little of it. and it yeah bad batch isn't bad um it's grown on me and the final season is definitely nothing like how the first two were so it's worth watching i know i really just wanted that show to be republic commando the show yeah (laughs) which ended on a cliffhanger which was so annoying the new one that's coming out the um tales of the empire looks good so i'm excited for that i think that comes out for the may the 4th stuff but i would have to double check because this is recorded before may the 4th so i'm not sure when it comes out but back to this movie um yoda meets with obi-wan he's still not on board with training anakin but he eventually caves allowing him to be trained then the funeral is held for qui-gon obi-wan tells anakin that you will be trained after all that and then um Meanwhile, Mace Windu speaks with Yoda, concerned about how there's always two Sith, a master and an apprentice, but just unfortunate for them, they don't know which one was killed. And then finally, the victory celebration in the Naboo sh- in the streets of Naboo. A parade of Gungans are given an orb of... Uh, I actually had to Google this. So Boss Nass is given the Globe of Peace, a relic of the Naboo people, a gesture of good faith between the, the Naboo, and the Gungans. And the movie ends with an upbeat rendition of the Emperor's theme, masking the evil that lies just behind the curtain. Bum, bum, bum. Dun, 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 dun. It is funny, that line about there's always two, like, no more, no less. I was like, I mean, yeah, kind of, but there's like a billion Dark Jedi. <laughs> like, just because they don't call themselves Sith doesn't mean they aren't there. It's like, what was Darth Maul? What was, uh... It's like, we got, we got Darth Plagueis, Darth Sidious, Dooku, As- Maul. Asajj Ventress wasn't, she was the third apprentice. Darth Maul was the third apprentice. Darth Maul has a brother <laughs> who's also a dark Jedi. <laughs> like, there's, there's a decent number of them around. I'm excited for the Acolyte when it comes out. At first, I thought of that entire thing of like, you know, the Sith haven't been seen in over a millennia. How are they going to explain this? But, you know, I'm open to like the interpretation. And some people pointed out that they consider Dathomir Night Sisters and witches acolytes. So this might be from that sect of um, mm. Dark Side or just Force usage. Because the listener, if you don't know, the Force is just the Force. It's it's an energy field. And Jedi, Sith, those are just specific, like, martial art forms, basically. That's all it is. So to call yourself a Jedi, it's just you follow those specific teachings, and that's, it's like a religion. And same thing with Sith, and the Night Sisters do their own thing, so, you know. It's about how you use it. Yeah, it's about how you use it. 
um, depending on how deep in the rabbit hole you go when it comes to the canon, I like to believe that there's a gray nature to the Force that you could use both. Just depends on context. Like the Jedi could use the the Jedi mind trick, but what separates the Jedi mind trick from being a good power versus a bad power, depending on how you use it. Same thing can go for like Force Lightning. They say only Dark Jedi and Sith can use Force Lightning, but an old canon Plo Koon could use it. So, you know, it's, mm. it's up there. Well, it wasn't what there was like a sort of gray Jedi novel, except he went crazy. I don't remember. I don't remember more about it, but maybe it was a short story. Maybe that's what it was. And don't forget, no after knows. 2014, that old canon is now legend. So none of Ugh. that shit matters anymore. Just just give me the Skywalker kids. That's all I want. Jason and Gina. None of this Kylo Ren crap. And Anakin. They had three they had three really well written characters. Yeah. <laughs> I do miss the old canon quite a bit. And I mean there was a lot of bad, but there was a lot of good with that too. It's just I mean, you can't tell me that you you wouldn't have loved the the new three movies to be about the the Yuzang Vong, like the Vong invasion. Oh, absolutely. I mean you know, I, I get there's a lot of bad stories from the old canon, but at the same exact time, when it comes to just, when it comes to Star Wars, I was like, what, 25, 26 when, not even, I was like 23, 24 when, um, I was in my early 20s when Disney bought Star Wars. That is 20, at least 15 to 18 years where I was dedicated and devoted to Star Wars, reading books reading i didn't read any of the comics um i think i read one and that was like the emperor's royal guard comic line that was really good but i mean i read a, a, a ton of the books i had like the encyclopedias that i still have you know i i played all the video games and i was knee deep in star wars for all of my formative life and for you to tell me everything that i currently know and love about this entire saga is now considered legends and it doesn't matter and exist anymore it's just it's really hard to put that down and then i try to embrace the new canon i read like the phasma book i read the aftermath trilogy which i really loved i liked it a lot but then when the phasma book came out it's like mad max meets star wars it was fucking cool and then they played her like a fiddle in the last jedi yeah, what, what was that they introduced her. She's cool. She's like the new Boba Fett. And then it's like, oh, no, she's just dead instantly. Yeah. And they treat her like Boba Fett in that case, too. Mm. And it's sad on how the best episode of Boba Fett is the one where he's in it just as much as he is in the original trilogy, which is sad. Two lines and like a footnote at the end of the episode. So, I mean, I don't know. Like, it's Star Wars is Star Wars. I will watch the good and the bad, and I'm still going to watch every piece of schlock that comes out, whether I know it's going to be good or bad or not. And it's just, it's a part of me. It's part of who I am. And I try to be open-minded for all the new stuff that comes out. But, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm still going to prefer the old stuff. And, you know, the new Daisy Ridley sequels that come out, I'm still going to watch it. I don't care. I spoiled all of Rise of Skywalker leading up to its release. I knew every beat of what was going to happen in that movie before I sat in that seat to watch it. It was terrible, but I still watched it. I've still seen it like three, four times afterward, too. And, you know, it's some people are like, oh, it ruined my childhood. It didn't ruin my childhood. I'll still always have that. I just can't continue to, you know, share those same stories because no one knows who the hell Jason Solo is, you know? Mm. When I say Anakin, people are just going to think of Skywalker. I'm like, well, there's also Anakin Solo, too, who has a great story. but Such a good story. And the Skywalker twins and like their, their connected telepathy and Chewie's valiant death. The Yuzan Vong invasion was great. I liked it a lot. So good. But I mean, yeah. we'll see how this ends. People, there's rumors of like Yuzan Vong, the new canon equivalent might come out. The Yuzan Vong Dean is... um extra galactic aliens that invade the star wars galaxy they're immune to the force they use bio weapons nothing is man made nothing is metal everything is organic and real and living and they look at the star wars galaxy like it's a plague and they're insulted and disgusted by all of the heavy technology use and a massive um 
campaign was drafted at Lucasfilm to create like a huge story arc. This spanned like 15, 20 books and novels, not comics, but like novels of um, leading a, this entire uh, war. And it was like a five, six year long book series that it took a long time to finish. And it really shook things up. They got permission from Lucasfilm to like kill off a major character. Chewie was killed in like the first book, I think it was. And it was a pretty big deal. And it was like toward the end of Star Wars, like, or at least that was when, like just before Disney, the Disney buyout, mm. when it um like wrapped up and finished, that's when the Disney buyout happened. So it was a pretty big deal in terms of the community, only because it's like, it was getting stale. Like what else can you do with Star Wars at this point in time? Because we're ready to like the old Republic coder, the video game came out. That was already kind of a big thing, but. And it's like, well, what can we do for after the Star Wars thing? It's like, well, we don't know yet because we can only tell the same story of like an Imperial Imperial warlord is trying to take over the galaxy again. They're like, oh, no, we got to stop him. That was the, it's like, oh, it's the, the ghost of an old Sith came back and is going to claim a body. Oh, yeah. we got to fight him. Yeah, it's the, it's the, they did that story a hundred times. And a lot of Star Wars fans were mad because a lot of the Rise of Skywalker was ripped off of um, what book was it? Palpatine comes back in the original canon and a lot of the story beats are the same and it's just like you couldn't have done a better job of adapting the story because you already said the story once you're just doing exactly the same thing so but i mean i star wars is a big thing for me and i know a lot of original trilogy fans did not like the prequels especially this one and this one gets a lot of shit for it but even on this rewatch to it it's just it's an important step to a much larger story and even though a lot of sequences can be easily taken out and it's not that great. I mean, the pod race itself and the final battle, I think that's worth the remaining hour and a half, two hours of this movie just for those two sequences. Good talk. All right. So <laughs> since y'all are dead, I'll wrap this up. Any closing questions, comments, hey, I, was, I was doing okay. <laughs> you kept up. I had nothing to add on the novels or the extended universe. I know you don't. What about... What about what about this specific movie? This specific movie, I enjoyed. They should make more of them. I did see episode two, and I did I saw episode three in theaters, which is an ongoing thing of, I walked out of the theater to go use the restroom, because I'm like, oh, okay, like nothing's going on, Palpatine's just talking, and then I come <laughs> back, and Mace Window's getting electrocuted and thrown out a window, and I'm like, oh, no. It's, so. it's literally that gif of, like, Donald, Donald Glover with the pizza comes into the room like oh, i'll be right back guys <laughs> whoa what happened dean your thoughts it it there's no emotional investment in the movie for me it just seems like just it's a plot that happens i don't really get invested in it it's just a movie for you i think it's a lucas that's a lucas problem yeah well, i guess I definitely oh yeah that. i mean the, the the only reason why david and i especially are so attached to this is because we had the original trilogy to really help to walk in into Star Wars with this as the very first one, it's really tough to like, oh, I've never seen Star Wars. Like, oh, cool. I get to share with you one of the greatest experiences of my life. Where the fuck do I start? Do I take the gamble on showing them a 50-year-old movie? Or do I take the other gamble of showing you the one that's much sooner, but it's probably one of the worst movies out of the entire nine? Mm. I mean, that's, that's the, the, I think one of the biggest things is that like, after you see these three, like, and when I showed my wife these, after we got through the prequels and we got to A New Hope, it, like, her reaction was like, wow, the acting is so much better in this. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, I care about these characters. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really tough to, uh, and then it's tougher to show people star wars nowadays when i say star wars i mean the like the 77 one mm -hmm. because after watching shit like endgame and avatar and you know it's just like with all of the modern advancements in film and television and just special effect making and it's like yeah star wars was innovative back then but you know what so is the chariot and we don't really use those anymore either so it's up with motorcycles ah uh, <laughs> You know, so like it's really tough to show them something that it's like this was a big deal back in the 70s because no one had seen anything like this before this point. Nothing was like that. 
but we've seen so much better now that it's it's more of like a um you know you're desensitized by its wonder that i'm nervous mm-hmm. about showing this stuff to especially the younger generation where like i they their first movie in the theater was like fucking end game like how do you compete against that like it's such a huge huge special effect movie that it's just here's a here's a thing a little mini model on a stick that we shot in front of a green screen like or blue screen you know it's so i, I also so tough i also think it's especially hard right because star wars is the most basic form of storytelling it's just the hero's journey and the prequels the original trilogy and the new ones it's just the formulaic here is the hero's journey and like and that's it it's a really simple way to tell a story that unless you have like really interesting like side characters and like world building there's really not a whole lot going on and i think that the prequels didn't necessarily do a great job at that world building i mean partially because they assumed that you knew everything about this world already for someone coming in episode one for the first time it's just like wow this is really confusing and kind of boring (laughs) yeah and lucas wasn't even on record to say that it's just taxation and trade routes as early as like at least the early 80s so it wasn't like it was something sprung up on the people like what is this political nonsense stuff like star wars has always been about politics it was Mm. even in the very first one but it's just it was kind of like it wasn't a front and center sort of thing so it's a lot harder to digest as your first movie where it's just like okay cool we're at the senate now and they're literally it's watching just a senate hearing like this is what we're can we get back to the action please yeah, I mean, on, on rewatch, this, I expected on this watch to not like it because my, my it's funny, my memory kind of like goes up and down like a roller coaster where I remember I absolutely loved it, couldn't get enough of it, and then watched it way too much and despised it. Yeah. But now it has been probably six years since I've seen it. I, I, I really liked it. I was just like, oh, I see kind of why I like this so much which I didn't expect. I thought I was going to be like, oh boy, this again. Yeah, the pod race is so long. Like, let's go. Um, yeah, I definitely feel that way about episode two, especially because I remember watching it a lot when it came out. And then over time, I really started to grow to hate it. Mm-hmm. And out of the three, I do feel two is probably the weakest of the prequels because of just the acting is front and center terrible. Yeah. And it has only like two segments that are good. The Anakin Padme relationship building just doesn't work there's no chemistry between them none so it's really hard to watch but yeah but actually i actually enjoyed episode one i didn't think i was going to but well maybe next year we'll continue this on and do episode two no i probably not probably do a more fun star war this time but we'll see but i want to thank everyone especially dean and tim for being very patient through this very long episode that I wanted to showcase and have been dying to do. Um, So thank you all for coming along on this revisit of Star Wars, The Phantom Menace. We have social media, but I'll admit we're not always good at pushing ads and keeping, you know, us in the forefront of your thoughts, but you can still find us over on Instagram at Screen Refresh, and please smash that like and subscribe button over on YouTube, which we now have at The Screen Refresh Network. You can shoot us an email over at screenrefresh at gmail.com or join us on our Discord. If you like what we've heard, like I said, please drop a review, rating, and subscribe to us on Spotify. Or we now are on YouTube. And wherever you get your podcast to help us out, it really does make a huge difference. Every podcast, uh, not podcast, every every influencer and social media uh, entity is like, please, it really helps the channel. It really helps the channel. Please. I know everyone says this, but likes and subscribing really helps that channel out. So for Tim, Dean, David, this is Nick. You take care of yourself, and you can catch us next on Rule of Thirds every third Monday of the month. And also our sister podcast, Don't Open This Podcast, every second and fourth Monday of the month. Fly, my Gungans. Fly.